ಓಪ್ಯಾಯಂತುಮಂಗಾ ವಾಕ್ಪ್ರಾಣಶ್ಚಕ್ಷುಶ್ರೋತ್ರಮಥೋ ಬಲಮಿಂದ್ರಿಯಿ ಚರ್ವಾಣಿ ಬ್ರಹ್ಮೋಪನಿಷದ ಮಾಂ ಬ್ರಹ್ಮ ನಿರಾಕುರಿಯಾಕರೋತ್ ಅನಿರಾಕರಣಮಸ್ತ್ವನಿರಾಕರಣ ಮೇಸ್ತು ತದಾತ್ಮನಿ ನಿರತೆಯುಪನಿಷತ್ಸು ಬ್ರಹ್ಮ ಸ್ತೇ ಮಯಿ ಸಂತು ತೇ ಮಯಿ ಸಂತು ಓಂ ಶಾಂತಿ 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 ಹರಿ ಓಂ ತತ್ಸತ್ ದಿಸ್ ಮಂತ್ರ ಅಕರ್ಸ್ ಇನ್ ದ ಬಿಗಿನಿಂಗ್ ಆಫ್ ದ ಕೇನ್ ಉಪನಿಷತ್ ಫ್ರಮ್ ದ ಸಾಮವೇದ ಯು ನೋ ದರ್ ಆರ್ ವೇದಸ್ ಹವ್ ಬೀನ್ ಕ್ಲಾಸಿಫೈಡ್ ಇನ್ ಟು ಫೋರ್ ಆಲ್ ದೋ ವೇದಸ್ ಆರ್ ಇನ್ಡಿವಿಸಬಲ್ ದ ಗ್ರೇಟ್ ಸೇಜ್ ವೇದ ವ್ಯಾಸ ಟು ಹೂಮ್ ವಿ ಓ ಎನಿಥಿಂಗ್ ವಿಚ್ ಇಸ್ ಕಾಲ್ಡ್ ಇಂಡಿಯನ್ ಲೆಗಸಿ ಸ್ಪಿರಿಚುವಲ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಕಲ್ಚರಲ್ ಹೆರಿಟೇಜ್ he classified the vedas into four of which samaveda is one of the most ancient <coughs> i began with this mantra because of the following reason there is a misconception that indian spirituality is too otherworldly it asks everybody to attain moksha nirvana somehow to escape from this world of misery just the opposite indian spiritual seers sages saints rishis munis have repeated repeatedly emphasized that you live in this world happily enjoy the goods of the world but within the framework of dharma righteousness and you are finished with this you will ask the question is there anything farther is there anything more when you come to the realization they call alam pratyaya means enough is enough is there anything higher you should naturally come to that and if you artificially come to that once again you'll fall back on the world and say i have left behind certain things and enjoyed it me go back so we talk about dharma artha and kama as the three important purusha arthas and moksha is the last purusha artha purusha means a human being artha means that which is sought by a human being that which a human being seeks is called a purusha artha what does a human being seek in life what do we seek in life pleasure you can come out with 100 answers but as swami vivekananda said a great sages with tremendous generalizers and classifiers they found out that all that man seeks can be classified as just four just like even the among kind of misery they classified how many kinds of misery you have in life <laughs> suppose they ask you how many kinds of sorrow sir you have oh swami innumerable kinds of sorrow so they came up with classification generalization they said there are three kinds of sorrow three varieties of sorrow the first and the most natural that you see which comes from your own body and mind i have a toothache toothache is terrible <laughs> i have a headache i have a backache and i have a ache in my mind somebody insulted me somebody betrayed me i am tremendously unhappy i have a pain not only in the neck i have a pain in the back and I have pain in my mind so this is one kind of sorrow which is most natural universal and common this is called adhyatmika dukha adhyatmika atma means within the body and the mind relating to the body and the mind the other kind of sorrow comes from the external world from beings living beings some of them in those days they used to live in forests wild animals of course now we live in cities you don't get tigers and uh, 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 lions here but you get cockroaches i don't know we have cockroaches here no yes we do <laughs> and in india we have insects called mosquitoes they are terrible beings 
and wherever there is, there is spirituality, mosquitoes always will be there. <laughs> they say in Bethlehem and in Israel, plenty of mosquitoes. Any spiritual place is always infested with mosquitoes. I have a feeling this mosquitoes should have been very spiritual beings. <laughs> so you sit down to meditate, the mosquitoes constantly they get to come and disturb you. Flies. When I was in Sydney, I was amazed to say with all the technology they couldn't control the flies. When you walk in the streets, particularly in summer, flies are constantly attacking you. So much so, everybody is walking is always saluting you like that. <laughs> then I asked a friend which was, who was walking me down, what is this? He said, this is called the Great Australian Salute. <laughs> So these kinds of sorrow are called sorrow which comes from beings, living beings. It could be even human beings. Human beings give so much of sorrow to you. Those you think are very dear to you, they suddenly come to you with either vituperative language or betrayal or backbiting. You feel deeply upset and sorrowful. It's called adhi bhautika dukkha. Bhuta means living beings. Adhi relating to Bhuta, living beings. And the third type of sorrow over which you have little control, earthquake. There's a tsunami. There's a catastrophe. There's a tornado. There's a gale and a storm. These, apparently, you have a little control over. Although, now we say, most of them are man-made. Environmental activists will scream and tell you because you have been exploiting the environment, cutting down trees, there is global warming, whatever. So these are called dukkha, coming, sorrow coming from natural calamities, natural causes. So we talked about adhyatmika, adi bhautika. This kind of sorrow is called adi daivika. Daivika, daiva means forces of nature. So these are the three types of sorrow. Can you think of anything else? Look at the challenge of our great rishis. You just can't think of any sorrow which will not fall, fall, fall under any of these three categories. Can you come up with one? Oh, all of you have no sorrow at all. You're so happy coming to the Vedanta Society. <laughs> In exactly the same way, they also classified what are the various things a man could seek. What does a human being seek? Of course, he seeks pleasure. To be able to enjoy pleasure, you need money. If your pocket is empty, <laughs> then you can't seek pleasure. So pleasure is called karma, the principle of pleasure. And the money which you require to be able to enjoy it is called artha. Artha is a very significant word in Sanskrit. Can you write that down? The four Purusharthas. Artha means money and artha also means meaning. <laughs> the meaning of a word is called artha. <laughs> you need money, you need some dollars in your pocket or euros or money, or rupees in India to be able to enjoy. So with artha, we enjoy karma. But the rider, the caveat, is that you shall not enjoy except within the framework of dharma. Dharma is a very difficult word to translate into English. It has been unfortunately translated as a religion, but religion and dharma are not the same. For want of a better word, we have called it religion. Dharma encompasses so many things. Dharma is righteousness, Dharma is goodness, dharma is nobility, dharma is virtuous conduct, dharma is religion, and dharma is a vast scope of anything which is noble, which elevates you from the brute level to the human level, from the human level to the divine level. This is what Swami Vivekananda says, the brute man is transformed into the human man, and the human man into the divine man. All of us are born human beings 
but we have to become human by cultivating certain virtues. This is a fundamental difference between animals and human beings. A dog is born a dog, and it's a dog because it's born a dog. A cow is a cow because it's born a cow. But a human being is not a human being just because he has a human form. <laughs> he may have a human form, but he may be animal inside. And therefore, to be able to acquire human qualities, to be able to be called a human being, you have to cultivate certain human values. This is called dharma. Dharma comes from a dhatu, you know, in Sanskrit, every word comes from a root, which is called the dhatu. It's called a verbal root. This is a peculiarity of this language. Every word in Sanskrit will have a dhatu, will have a root. And the meaning of the dhatus have been clearly enunciated in what is called the dhatu patha by Panini. Panini is one of the greatest of linguists of all time. He codified the Sanskrit grammar. He has got a book called the Ashtadhyayi, eight chapters, Sutra Patha. In Sanskrit, in Indian literature, we want to be very precise. It's called a sutra, is kind of an aphorism. Don't write longish sentences. Don't go on writing essays after essays which nobody reads. Be pithy, precise, and very short. The three P's which are associated with the Sutra, punctilious, profound and powerful. Very, very small, but contains a huge amount of meaning. So he composed certain Sutras to codify the Sanskrit grammar. It is one of the remarkable books and presently considered as a marvel by everybody in the world, in the world of linguistics. He has another book called the Dhatu Patha. Dhatu Patha means classifying the Dhatus, how many Dhatus are there in Sanskrit. There are about 4,000 of them. We normally use hardly by a few hundred. And words can be formed using a Dhatu, adding to them what is known as a suffix called Pratyaya and a prefix which is optional. Now, Panani in the Dhatu Patha says the word the Dhatu Dhr is at the root of the word Dharma. Dhr, can you write that? T H R I with a, with a dot below R. Yeah. It's difficult to pronounce that. Dhr. Like bird. Dhridhatu means to hold. To hold. Right? To hold. What holds society together is dharma. I must, you must have heard by, uh, I think, W.B. Yeats, The Second Coming of Christ. <laughs> Very famous poem. Things fall apart. The center cannot hold. There is anarchy everywhere. The blood-dimmed tide is raised. And the best lack all conviction, while the worst are full of passionate intensity. There is the poem. The tragedy of the modern world is the best lack all conviction. We are the best, we are good. But we are not convinced about goodness as much as wicked people are convinced about wickedness. Why is the world in such a bad state? Not because of wicked people, but because of good people like us. Why? We are good not because we believe in goodness, but because we are afraid not to be good. Why do you tell the truth? I may be caught telling a lie. It is safer to tell the truth. You feel that you have to tell the truth because you are afraid to tell untruth. Wicked people are completely convinced about the power of wickedness and therefore they thrive. 
half a dozen wicked people can hold a few thousand good people to ransom because the good people are good not because they have convinced conviction about goodness but because they are afraid not to be good i call this goody goodiness not goodness <laughs> we are not good we are we are goody goody and we are not convinced about the power of goodness as much as wicked people are convinced about the power of wickedness he says therefore the best lack all conviction and the worst of full of passionate intensity center cannot hold things are falling apart to prevent things from falling apart you need a glue a cementing factor which will hold the society together this is known as dharma coming from dhru dhatu to hold you know what is the modern word for this if i tell it you know oh that's it is very commonly used these days hold means to sustain dharma therefore in the modern parlance should be translated as the sustainability factor we talk about sustainable development all of you know the united nations came up with sustainable development goals s d g is being talked about everywhere we have to promote the sustainable development goals the millennium development goals came first then the uno came up with sustainable development goals the sustainable development goal was projected in india thousands of years ago as a dharma dharma is a principle of sustainability which holds society together therefore people were taught you want to enjoy good enough go ahead you want money for it come on earn but all this should be in within the framework of dharma you have a dharma framework within that you earn money in the righteous means and enjoy without affecting others possibility of equal enjoyment i enjoy not at the expense of others but i enjoy within the principle of dharma which will not adversely affect others equal opportunity for enjoyment that is democracy so the basic principle of dharma according to swami vivekananda is unselfishness don't live for your own self because everybody lives for only himself society will break to pieces you live for the other people question can be asked unselfish is not a great virtue you suffer because of that don't be too unselfish you have to be selfish a little now the modern thinking is you have to be unselfish in order to be selfish what does it mean the term which is used now is enlightened selfishness i'll tell you a story there is a farmer who was using expensive seeds in his farm not only was he using it he was distributing to all the people in the neighboring farms free of cost somebody told him don't be so unselfish man he smiled and said i am doing this because i am selfish what does it mean the answer is very simple suppose i use expensive good seeds in my farm and the people in the neighborhood use bad seeds the chances are the birds will pick up those seeds and put it in my farm and my expensive seeds may go to their farm i can't prevent the birds from doing it therefore in order that i will be protected from bad seeds i have to give good seeds to everybody else <laughs> so think of this example in order that i be happy i be peaceful i will need everybody in my neighborhood to be peaceful if my neighbor is not peaceful i can't be peaceful coming to nations now the present context i come from india as you know we have some neighboring countries like bangladesh 
पाकिस्तान श्रीलंका भूटान नेपाल टेक दिस फाइव इफ पाकिस्तान इज नॉट पीसफुल इफ बांग्लादेश इज नॉट पीसफुल इफ श्रीलंका इज नॉट पीसफुल आई कान बी पीसफुल ना there is no near and far in the globalized society america usa cannot be peaceful unless europe is peaceful france is peaceful syria is peaceful every other country in the world is peaceful which means i have to ensure that there is peace everywhere in order that i may be peaceful that is the selfishness i want to be peaceful i want to be happy in order to ensure that i have to ensure that everybody else around me is equally peaceful and happy therefore selflessness is a kind of selfishness there's an very interesting shloka in sanskrit parartha eva yasya swartha parartha unselfishness itself is the creed by which you ensure that you yourself are happy and selfish therefore in order to be able to practice dharma what you need is that you should see that everybody else around you is also able to pursue the goal of artha and kama enjoyment and acquisition of money I'll give you a simple story. I heard it happened in US in UK. There was a person, you know, the British aristocracy. They are very proud people. They take a dog and keep walking, and they with stiff upper lip they say. And this person is whirling, whirling his walking stick, and walking along with his dog. Another gentleman is coming in front. and the stick hit his nose and he became furious you have no right to hit me like that he said this is my walking stick i can whirl my stick i have a fundamental right you should have been more careful as a big fight between these two and they went to court there is a remarkable judgment <laughs> the british judges were very witty the judge gave a verdict to say yes you have every right to hold your walking stick it's your stick but your right to hold the stick ends where the other man's nose begins <laughs> that is dharma you are a practice of enjoyment and acquisition of wealth should not adversely affect the possibility and the right of the other man to equally enjoy so this is the principle of what is called yagna in sanskrit the bhagavad gita third chapter fourth chapter elaborately discusses this yagna yagna is sacrifice and this is rooted in the cosmic sacrifice what is that god himself sacrificed himself to be able to create this world what a sacrifice god is doing in order to sustain all of us here sitting sustain the entire universe of beings living and non living constantly god is sacrificing himself so you are only participants in a cosmic sacrifice there's a remarkable uh, vision you are sitting and talking and moving and eating here uh, what are you doing i am a participant in a cosmic sacrifice of god and as a participatory co-worker with god i find my life's fulfillment so if i do that sacrifice and participate as a cosmic sacrifice i will constantly think about how the other people can be equally happy as i am or more happy than i am if everybody worried about other people's happiness the world will be a extraordinary place <laughs> because it's based on the fundamental principle you can't be happy unless everybody is else is equally happy so this is the principle called dharma and dharma is what informs all the other purusharthas then you are very dharmic is come to sanskrit now in in english 
So we will not use the word righteous or religious, etc. We will say the word dharmic, absorbing dharma into English. You are very dharmic. You don't worry about religion or God. You are a very noble person, unselfish, pure, helpful, loving. And you acquire wealth and righteous means, help everybody, and you enjoy, allow others to enjoy. Now the question which has been asked in the ancient India, is that enough? This is where we slowly move ahead of the culture where it says, you be humanitarian, you be philanthropic, you be altruistic. These are the buzzwords now. But in India we said that is not enough. When you are finished with all this, dharma, artha and kama, an inquiry arises within you which asks you, is that the purpose of human life? I have done so much of charity, so much of philanthropy. I love the human beings. I have sacrificed myself. But I am not feeling deeply satisfied. I want to discover the higher dimensions of life. Is it all? When your mind is purified through philanthropy and charity and sacrifice, then an inquiry arises spontaneously from the depths of your being from the deeper most recesses of your heart, which asks, what is beyond this? This inquiry is called jnana. Jnana is knowledge. Jnana is inquiry. As I said yesterday, Indian thought has progressed through observation and analysis as in science of our daily experiences. It is just a pure science. You don't ask questions which are theoretical. You ask questions which relate to your daily life and try to discover answers based upon daily experiences. I am asking fundamental questions about my experience. Naive, simple, most ordinary questions and Amazingly, I come up with extraordinary, powerful, profound answers. That is Indian wisdom, that is the Upanishad, that is the Veda. So I inquire, what is beyond this? Last time, yesterday, we talk about the three fundamental entities. Can you put that uh, triangle again? Jiva, Jagat and Ishvara. What does the world consist of? We discussed it elaborately yesterday from the point of a bhakti. Today we will discuss it from the point of a jnana. Jiva is the individual being, which is me. I am a jiva, you are a jiva, everybody here are so many jivas. Jiva is a living being, not necessarily a human being. Even a dog or a cat could be a jiva. For our present purposes, let us restrict to human beings only. When we have a conference of dogs and cats, we can discuss the other things. <laughs> Time could come. We can have a big spiritual conference retreat for dogs. <laughs> <laughs> you have to speak in their language. but So these are jivas. I am a jiva, you are a jiva, a living being. And what does the jiva do? He looks at the world around him. As soon as you are born as a child, what did you do? You opened your eyes and saw a strange world which is impinging upon you. Of course, started crying. There's a beautiful uh, poem by Tulusi Das, a great saint, poet, poet of India, who wrote the Ramayana, it's become very famous. He said, when you came into the world, you cried and everybody was smiling and was happy. Live in such a way that when you leave this world, you will go laughing and everybody else will cry. <laughs> the remarkable statement. So you started crying. You didn't know what was around you. And 
Later on, you discovered you, there's a person who gave birth, it's called, a, uh, it's called your mother, and there's a father. You slowly become related to this world outside. So I, as a jiva, see the world impinging upon me. In philosophy, we call it I, the self, and the other, which I perceive, see, experience. How do I experience this world? We discussed it yesterday, through the five senses. I see through the eyes, I hear through the ear, I taste through the tongue, I smell through the nose, and I touch by the skin, tactile sensation. These are called five senses which give me knowledge. Knowledge is jnana, senses are called indriyas in Sanskrit. So these five are called jnana indriyas. Jnana indriyas meaning five organs of sensation or perception. These five Gyanendriyas are responsible for giving me any input I can have about the world outside. So I as the Jiva is looking at this world. This is all that is to life. So the inquiry into Jnana begins with a profound statement of the existence of these two. <coughs> I am quoting from Shankaracharya's commentary, Bhashya, and the Vedanta Sutras. Vedanta has three fundamental canons. They are called Prasthanatraya. One is the Upanishads, second is the Bhagavad Gita, third is called the Brahma Sutra, the Vedanta Sutras. Shankaracharya commenting on the Vedanta Sutras begins with just two important words, Yushmad Asmat Pratyaya. Yushmad Asmat Pratyaya ho Vishaya Vishaya no ho. That is the beginning. Yushmad is you, Asmat is I. That's all that is to life. You and me. Can you think of anything else? I, looking at all of you. One on one, it's me and you. One to many is me and you. In English, you means singular as well as plural. <laughs> in, in Sanskrit, you have different words for singular and plural. So I and you interacting with each other, impinging one upon the other, sometimes happy, sometimes pleasant, sometimes quarreling. This is all that is to life. Now, this world which I see is that which is perceived by me, known by me, seen by me, smelt by me, tasted by me, touched by me, heard by me, Panchindriyas. This is an object which I see, perceive, experience. Who is it that is perceiving? I, who am the subject as contradistinguished from the object. This is very obvious, isn't it? There is no philosophy in this. It's just an experience. I, the subject, is perceiving the object which is this world. I am the perceiver and this object called the world is perceived. I am the knower and this world which is known is the object which is known. I am the seer and this world is the scene. Now, what is the process of perception? I am the knower and this world is the known. The process by which I know this is called knowledge, isn't it? Just like the known, knower and knowledge. Put a triangle. There is a now known which is the object, right? Known and put object bracket. The knower on the left hand side, yeah. Knower who is a subject. And uh -huh, yeah, arrow, double arrow. Uh -huh. This is called knowledge. This is extremely simple, isn't it? 
there's nothing uh, philosophical or theological or uh, spiritual about it. I, the knower, I see this as the known, the object, and the process of knowledge by which this, these two come together. In Sanskrit, it is called Triputi. Three means three. Three is three. <laughs> In Sanskrit, it is also three. The three, T-H-R-E-E, must have come from Sanskrit three. Triputi, the knower, the known, and knowledge. The seer, seen, and the process of seeing. The hearer, the heard, process of hearing. The taster, the tasted, and the process of tasting. This is called Triputi. For every knowledge to be possible, you need three things. Now, the object which is known, this table, this microphone, this wall, this building, the sky, the stars, the planets, the atom, the molecules, all of them could be non-living beings. They may not be jivas. This table, of course, has no life. But a perceiver, can he be a lifeless non-jiva? No. He can't be because how can he perceive? A perceiver, therefore, we see, is one who is a conscious entity. And a perceived could be an un unconscious entity. It could be conscious. I'm seeing you as a conscious entity, but it could be unconscious. Unconscious in Sanskrit is called jada. You should remember once again in the Indian parlance, the Vedantic wisdom, life and consciousness are separated and thought of differently. Life is called prana, and consciousness is called chaitanya. These are two different things. An animal at a very lower level may, be, may have life, but may not have consciousness, even if it has its a very rudimentary, undeveloped form. A human being has consciousness highly developed, and he has the capacity to be able to expand his consciousness in order to re realize himself as the universal consciousness, which an animal cannot. Consciousness in any self-awareness? Yeah, I'm coming to that. So conscious entity is one which is not only conscious of the other, but conscious of itself. What is meant by a conscious entity? I am a conscious being. I am aware of this object outside. But I am also aware of myself as being conscious. I am talking. I am also aware that I am talking. I am eating. I am aware that I am eating. The awareness of myself, which is called self-awareness, is a hallmark of a conscious entity, Chaitanya. Chaitanya can fall back upon itself and be self-aware. The quality of self-awareness distinguishes Chaitanya, consciousness, from Jada, which is unconscious. This table can't be aware of itself, nor can it be aware of anybody else. And consciousness can be independent of the unconscious, but the unconscious can't be independent of the conscious. Let us appreciate this sentence. <laughs> what is the quality which is common to everything in the universe? Everything. Suppose you say life, this is living. Or suppose you are human beings. All of you are sitting here. You are you're an American, you are a European, you are an Indian. So many differences among human beings with regard to country. You are a Christian, somebody is Jewish, somebody is a Hindu. Differences with regard to religion. You are a man, she is a woman. Differences with regard to gender. There are so many differences among human beings, but what is the common factor among everybody? That everybody is a human being. 
a dog peeps in and a cat peeps in. Sir, what about me? Are you leaving me out? Oh, you are there. All right, let us extend this a little more. Living being. Then cat is satisfied, dog is satisfied, and we are of course satisfied. Then this table and the chair come and ask me, Sir, are you leaving me out? You are sitting on me as a chair, but I don't have no pl I have no place in your scheme. Oh, you are here. Oh, that's the trouble. I can't call you a living being. What should I call the whole thing? Subsuming the entire thing. Let me drop the living. What do you get? Being. Suppose you use the word being. Does it cover everything? Yes? Being is something which covers everything. As a living being, non-living being, cats and dogs, animals, human beings, chairs, tables, sun, moon, stars, planets, atom, molecules, everything is covered. Being. So what is the hallmark? It exists. Existence or being. The moon exists, the sun exists, atoms exist, molecule exists, particles exist, human beings exist, animals exist. In elementary arithmetic in school you must have said Ax plus Bx plus Cx plus Dx equal to x multiplied by within bracket a plus b plus c plus d. I think you remember is just primary, primary school. I exist, you exist, sun exists, planets exist, tree exists, animals exist. So you say existence bracket animal plus tree plus atoms plus molecules plus the sun plus the moon humans men women american european plus dot 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 up to infinity so what is common is existence you extract that see how the generalized human mind works in the uh, in the indian uh, spiritual wisdom you generalize the whole thing because the human mind in india was not satisfied with only particulars. You have to have a general of which this particular is only a mode of expression. The exactly science has developed. Science is never satisfied with particulars. Some of you must have some idea of chemistry. Have you read the periodic table of elements? Yeah. Loser Mayer was a person and then the Mandelief. These are two people. So many elements came to be discovered. A hundred elements, how should you... Then somebody said, 100 elements can't, there should be some common principle. There should be a generalized principle by which they can act. So they classified them into periods and columns and rows, you know that. And we studied in school. How does one element interact with some other element? How do reactions take place? What is the principle by which they do? So how human mind is searching? There should be a principle behind this. It can't be a random kind of interaction, reaction between one element and the other. Then they found out, you must have read this in school, every element in the periodic table interacts with every other element in such a way as to attain the nearest inert gas configuration in the periodic table. Remember that? It will interact in such a way as to acquire the inert gas configuration nearest to it. Inert gases are gases which don't interact at all. Helium. Helium is no compound. Helium is a loner. Unmarried. <laughs> Carbon has four wives. <laughs> valency four. CH4. Carbon requires four to complete its valency. It calls four hydrogen atoms. Can you collaborate with me? CH, 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 CH4. One husband and four wives. Helium, poor fellow, <laughs> is a loner, remaining as a bachelor. It could have joined the Ramakrishna order. <laughs> so it doesn't interact at all. 
So every element wants to become non-interactive. Look at the philosophy. Why I am telling this is because human mind has always searched into something which ultimately becomes a philosophical principle. Every discovery of science has come on the basis of a fundamental philosophical principle. But this is not the occasion for it. Why do you want to become inert gas? Why do you want to be non-interactive? Interaction produces heat, light, sound and lot of energy is wasted. You call it exothermic or endothermic reaction. Heat is generated and heat is absorbed. Yeah, reaction is bothersome. If you're non-interactive, you're happy. So this is called by Einstein, it seems funnily called this, law of cosmic laziness. <laughs> Every particle in the universe wants to be lazy. Non-interactive. This is a philosophical principle behind this. So we extract the whole thing out and say existence, bracket, all that you have. All that you have meaning, human beings, animals, tables, chairs, sun, plan, planet, macrocosm, microcosm. What is the difference between all this? What is the difference between you and me? I have a name which is different from you. I have a form which is different from you. That's all. All the manifested world consists of Nama and Rupa, names and forms. See how the human mind is searching. They are asking, within the brackets you have so many, what is the difference between all this? Name and form. If you remove the name and form, there is nothing, all are equal. How do you know? Experientially, do you experience this? All of us experience this every day. What is their state? All of us experience the vanishing of the name and form every day. When you are deeply asleep. Called Sushupti. Where there is nothing, there is no name, no form. You don't realize yourself as a monk or a non-monk or as a human being or a, or a, 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 a woman or man. So they realize the bracket is only because of name and form. All that occurs in the bracket, outside the bracket, is existence. So what you call the existence, is it fundamental? Or what occurs in the bracket is fundamental? Now tell me this. You have a bracket. What does bracket contain? All that you have in the universe. The difference between, let us call it uh, x1, x2, x3, x4, etc. Up to x infinity. How does x1 differ from x2? Name and form. How does x2 differ from x3? Name and form. So all that you have within brackets are characterized by a form and a name. Now if you extracted existence away from them and take an existence which is independent of name and form, is it becoming too much? No. Very simple. It's difficult path which is most simple. <laughs> So you extracted out existence, within bracket you have all the name and form. If you take the existence per se, not moon exists or sun exists and I exist and you exist, but pure extracted <coughs> unqualified existence with the outside bracket. That doesn't have a name and form. And that is a common factor by which gives Meaning to the, all the world of existence. If existence were not common, this world will have no meaning at all. Everything has existence. So people said, you can't think of existence, pure existence. How do you explain this? So Vedanta, Indian wisdom has used the word, pure existence. Is there impure existence? Of course. When existence is polluted by name and form, it becomes impure. Because that is not the common factor. They call it in India, in Sanskrit, pure is called Shuddha. Existence is Sat. So they say it is pure Sat. Sat is the word which is used for existence. It is a very remarkable word, Sat. So you realize that Sat 
Bhakti is the pure essence of everything that you have. It is very simple, isn't it? No. I am not talking philosophy. I am talking, simply talking about what we are and how we are. Now, if you silently erase this bracket totally, <laughs> which is happening to you in deep sleep, you remain as pure existence, without name and without form. Now, what is existence? Of course, existence is that which exists. It is not that which exists. It is not that. It is, it is just existence. <laughs> pure existence. How do you know? Does existence require anything else to reveal itself? No. You ask this, you go into this question. Does existence itself require anything else to reveal itself? Let us once again go to the process of reductio ad absurdum. We discussed it yesterday. There is a process of proof in science and mathematics, which is called reductio ad absurdum, reducing to an absurdity. If a theorem has to be proved, you assume that theorem is not true, take the opposite to be true, and then go on finding out the consequences. If you end up with absurdity, then you go back and say the theorem is true. This is a, an accepted, valid method of proof. Let us use this here. Existence, does it require anything else apart from itself to reveal itself? Without saying yes or no, let us try to prove this. Assume that existence requires something else apart from itself to prove it, to reveal itself. That existence, is it part of this existence? You say existence E1 requires E2 to prove it. Then are E2 and E3 different? If you say S, then the difference can happen only through name and form. If E1 doesn't have a name and form, E2 also does not have a name and form, they can't be different. So you come up with a startling conclusion which the Rishis realized in the depths of their being and documented them in the Upanishads. Existence is self-revealing. This is an extraordinary discovery. We call it Swayam Prakasha. You write that to some sentence. Existence, Swayam Prakasha. Prakasha means revealing. Swayam is without any external help. Existence reveals itself. Existence does not require anything else apart from itself to reveal itself. Prakasha means light, usually. Why the concept of light comes in? Because light is what reveals to you. If everything is dark, you can't be reveal anything. So, it is prakasha, it is light. What is that light? Light is an independent light. And therefore, Chaitanya existence itself is a kind of self-revealing light of consciousness. It is called Swayam Jyoti. Jyoti is Prakasha. Swayam Prakasha. There is a beautiful dialogue in Brihadaranyaka Upanishad between Janaka and Yagyavalkya. <coughs> he raises this question, yeah. So, what do you love? When you don't have an object and subject, who you are Prakashing to? The object is missing. That's the difficulty. See, we always are trained to think in terms of subject-object. I am saying, see, I am not, I am saying that there is an existence which can be extracted out of all that exists. Existence itself, by its very presence it is revealing. We are conditioned into thinking that it has to be revealed to somebody. Revealed to something. There is an object to look at it. But to, for an object to exist, it has to have a name and form. I am talking of a pure existence which is without form and without name. And that existence, I claim, has to be self-revealing because there can't be any other existence apart from itself to reveal itself. 
because if there were another existence, these two existences will become the same, identical. What happens in deep sleep? In deep sleep, you are just existing, that's all. You realize yourself as just existence. You don't ask in deep sleep, to whom am I revealing? Because there is no you there. If you think of pure existence by itself, this existence is revealing itself, not because it is revealing to somebody, not because revealing is a quality which it possesses, but revealing is itself its very swarupa or nature because it is just existence. The Brother in Yukupanishad, there is a context between dialogue between Janaka and Yajna Valka, the Jyotiru Brahmana it's called. What is the light by which man functions? We eat, we move around, we run around, we talk. What is the light by which? Of course the light of the sun. The sun is up, everybody is up. Oh, I have an appointment now and then you eat, move around. When the sun sets, what is the light by which you function? Then the answer given, the light of the moon. When the sun sets and the moon sets, what is the light by which you function? Light of fire. Fire is all this is fire. <laughs> when the sun sets and the moon sets and the fire is extinguished, what is the light by which you function? By the light of walk, speech. If everything becomes totally dark, Hey, who is there? Please don't move around. I am here. You communicate through walk. When the light of the sun goes away, the moon sets, the fire is extinguished, and speech is hushed. What is the light by which you function? They say it is the Atma Jyoti. It is the pure light of consciousness. This Jyoti is not like this ordinary light. This Jyoti Therefore, it is called, to distinguish it between the ordinary light, you put a capital L, how do you describe it? And then say, it's the light of all lights, light of lights. Tat chubram jyotisham jyotihi tadyad atma vidho vidhu mandukho panishad. Jyotisham jyoti, jyotira jyoti ujjwala hridi kandara tumitama bhanjanahar. Swami Vivekananda in the him, you are the Jyotira Jyoti, you are the light of lights, meaning you are pure light of consciousness. Now, this existence therefore does not depend upon anything else for its revolution. But the Jada, all this bracket, will require consciousness or existence to reveal them. So there are two types of existences. One is existence of the Jadapadartha which is dependent upon the existence of consciousness to reveal it. And the second is pure existence which is independent existence. I will give you a simple example. Beluru Math, where I come from, as you know is the headquarters of the Ramakrishna Mat and the Ramakrishna Mission. Huge festivals are held several times in a year. During a very special festival of the birth anniversary of Ramakrishna, there is called a public celebration following Sunday. Almost 100,000 people come. Unimaginably huge crowd. Constantly the loudspeakers cry out, John, John, your child is crying here, where, where you are, come to the inquiry stall. Because the child gets lost. Constantly inquiries. Imagine a situation. Scene, act one, scene one. You are just about to go to the office and you have to catch a train which leaves at half past eight. It's already eight. You are delayed. Your tea is cold. You get angry with everybody. And you have an important meeting for which you are not prepared and you are expecting the boss to fire you. 
and at that time that file which you have to take for the meeting are unable to trace it where did that file go your wife tells you where did you show it me you kept it you are all the time argumentative i want that file finally you open the drawer and see the file is already there act 1 scene 2 velur mat the mother is crying hey where did you go john john where are you john responds from a distance mummy i am here think of the first and to second situation when you are crying where is the file the file did not say oh i am here why are you crying there in the second situation act 1 scene 2 the child says i am here what is the difference consciousness can announce itself whereas jada cannot announce itself fundamental difference jada padartha insentiencing with a unconscious object he is not self revealing this boy this little child is able to announce itself as existing so the capacity to be able to reveal oneself as existing is the hallmark of consciousness self awareness now awareness of existence is joy think of this statement very often we we feel it you go to a mountain place you go to a, the sea is just nearby nobody is around you sit there what do you feel you just feel i am i am that's all you are just aware of your own existence in that place and you feel greatly joyful this is called atma arama arama is resting finding joy atma is in your own self existence you are just absorbed in your own existence and that self absorption gives you joy awareness of existence is joy joy in sanskrit is called ananda chit is the name of awareness self awareness so sat which is existence is self revealing chit and the self awareness of existence is ananda so the nature of the conscious supreme reality is sat chit ananda just like that this is the vedantic conclusion and it is not philosophical it is not metaphysical it is simple logical conclusion that you arrive when you investigate into your daily experience you move on to find that sat chit ananda is the swarupa or the fundamental nature of the ultimate reality and the satchidananda swarupa in association with name and form creates this world so the entire scope of our life and existence is then below you write nama roopa nama roopa name and form so you write 1 2 so all that you need to know is only five things we have reduced the entire scheme of existence and life itself in just five realities this is from the panchadashi the great vedantic text it says sat chit ananda nama and rupa the five things the first three sat chit ananda swarupa are independent existences and therefore they are of the nature of the supreme reality why supreme reality is independent of anything else we need He is independent of you 
because he is self-revealing. Chaitanya or consciousness is independent of matter, but matter has to depend on consciousness to get revealed. So matter, Nama Rupa, is the world of matter, and Sat Chit Ananda is spirit. So all that you need to know in this world, Jagat is Nama Rupa, and Brahman is Sat Chit Ananda. So how from the world of Nama Rupa you intuit the Brahman which is Sat Chit Ananda is the next step in Jnana. All of us are conditioned by Nama Rupa and we are very proud of it. What's your name? From the beginning a child is born. In India it's Nama Karana is a very important uh, ceremony. And then you said, your name is this. And then you condition the child. Repeat your name. Your name is? My name is this. My name is? My name is Amal. My name is Bimal. In India you call John and Mary or whatever. <laughs> Repeat your name. Your name is? Repeat your name. Till the child is conditioned to thinking he is John or Mary. Which he is not. We don't tell the child, you have, don't have a name, you don't have a form, you are the Satchitananda Swarupa. <laughs> In ancient India, there was a mother who did it. Her name was Madalasa. Mm -hmm. Swami Vekanda speaks about it with great feeling. This Madalasa was a highly Vedantic woman. When the child was being rocked on the cradle, lullaby, the song which puts the child to rest, seems to Shuddhosi, Nirandanosi, Satchidananda, Swaruposi. She says, You are Shuddha, you are pure, you are the eternal, and you are Satchidananda, Swarupa. <laughs> the great saint called Ashtavakra, when he was in the mother's womb, the father was constantly reciting these great statements. Till in the prenatal stage, he acquired his real nature. When he came out of the womb, he was already realized. <laughs> These are our stories. Now psychologists and gynecologists, if there are any you will know, they have said prenatal influence is something tremendous. When a child is in the womb, the mother is particularly persuaded and asked to think of elevating thoughts. Fast, meditate on God, think of God. She should fill her mind and heart with noble ideas so that they will percolate to the child who is in the womb. Just like mother is feeding the child. Who feeds the child in the womb? The mother is feeding the child. So not on the physical food. You feed the child with noble ideas. That's why in India, series of ceremonies are there. When you are pregnant to three months, six months, nine months. At every point there is a ceremony, chanting of the mantras, Vedas. And then you pray and pray, my child should come with very noble ideas in, when it comes. So when we, we say, when a child grows up and becomes very spiritual, they say, oh, what a wonderful this boy is. You and your mother both are monks. <laughs> How did it come? Because of samskaras of the mother and the father, the parents, the grandparents. The whole family in India is tuned to something else, noble spiritual ideas. Therefore they say, don't tell the child you have a name and you have a farm, don't condition it. We have to have a name, we have to have a farm. Of course, you can't function otherwise. I go to the passport control office. Swami, what's your name? My name is Sachidananda. <laughs> then they will write Sachidananda. <laughs> I, have, I don't have a name, I don't have a farm. Sir, here is a very peculiar person called a psychiatrist. <laughs> yeah. In practical life, you need a name and farm to function. But you realize within you have a no name and no form. So Satchit Ananda is the Swarupa of Brahman and Nama Rupa is the Swarupa of the nature of the Jagat. These are two entities which we have. We began with this Yushmat Asmat Pratyayo. Yushmat is the Jagat. Asmat is myself which is the Atman of Consciousness. What is the nature of the Asmat? I is Satchit Ananda Swarupa. So the inquiry in jnana is who is the perceiver, 
who is the I, who is the conscious entity. And the whole inquiry in science is who is the perceived. <laughs> These are two branches of knowledge. Science perceives the external world, which is the Yushmat, and inquires into the nature of the external world. Science grows. Tremendous discoveries are made. Vedanta, or spirituality, inquires into the consciousness which is perceiving this. Because science does not know what is matter. We talk about material science. We talk about natural science. We talk about physical science. If we ask a physicist, can you define matter? Matter is not even... When we were children, we used to study in school books. Matter is something which occupies space. I think you must have studied this. It changed quite a bit. People ask, what is space? Space is something which is occupied by matter. <laughs> you go round and round. It's a cyclic knowledge. So there are certain fundamental things which are indefinable. Vedanta says, which is perceived by consciousness. Science will say, don't bring in consciousness. We are pure materialists. But without having a characteristic of matter as knowability by consciousness, matter cannot be defined. One characteristic of matter is that it is knowable by consciousness. So matter is characterized by knowability by a conscious principle. But the conscious principle can isolate itself from matter and stand alone. But matter cannot stand alone without consciousness. This is a fundamental take on jnana. So we'll break now and assemble after 15 minutes. Now let's find out how you can isolate the Satchitananda from matter and stand alone and move from the world of dead matter and, and the material objects to the world of the spirit. Come back, of course, and have tea. <laughs> So before, um, just to make things easier, we have a lot of people. So I want to ask you guys to just fold up your chairs so people can get out, okay? And just put them in the office. Um, I'm going to request everybody just to go out through the front door. We have two bathrooms in the back, but uh, and we have snacks and drinks and all sorts of stuff to refresh your body. Um, go through the back, and we'll meet here in 20 minutes at approximately 11:45, okay? Uh, 1140 uh, reporting, 1145 departure. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and one thing, if you, if this yeah. is some, for some of us, if it's going beyond our mind, we have to go through it again. That's not a problem. This, we have one of our devotees, John Monday, Dharmadas, who is recording all of this. And within two weeks, this will be on Monday Media. It'll, we will put a, we'll put, we'll put a link to where you can see it for free. No, but is it, uh, is it, isn't it very simple? No. <laughs> You're making it very simple, just in case. We want to go, it's, it's always good to go back. So thank you again. Much kind. Nam is space. So Nama Rupa is actually space time. And if you push it a little more concretely, it's related to body and mind. Now Rupa is body. You are fat, you are slim, you are beautiful, your hair is grey, your hair is black. The whole thing is related to the body. And name is mind. So body, mind, name, form, space, time. You can, uh, these three are synonymous, are the, the different languages. If you want to speak in terms of physics, it is space, time. In terms of Vedanta, it is name and form, Nama Rupa. Or in terms of just ordinary layman's language, it is body-mind. So Vedanta therefore says, the Satchidananda, which is the only reality, which is you, is somehow caught up in this Nama Rupa, <laughs> name and form. It is nameless and formless. But somehow you think you have form, you have a name, you are conditioned. That means you have a body, you have a mind. We call it body-mind complex. In Sanskrit they call it Dehatma buddhi. Here atma means mind. The buddhi, the feeling, the experience that I have a body, I have a mind. 
All the problems arise because you feel I have a body and I have a mind. <laughs> All misery arises because you have a body and mind. Adi Bhautika. And this body mind is conditioned by space time. And therefore, Satchit Ananda Swarupa, existence, consciousness, bliss, is not conditioned by space time. That which is unconditioned, conditioned by space time, we call it relative. Relative because anything which is conditioned by space time changes. Your body, of course, changes. Ah, I saw you so slim and happy, Swami, you now become so fat. Ah, oh, you're a small kid, you're grown up. Oh, your hair was so beautifully black, now it's turned grey. Body is constantly changing. Mind is also changing. So conditioning by space and time means change. And in scientific parlance, we call it a relative. As contradistinguished from that, that which is unconditioned by time and space, we call it non-relative. The word for it is absolute. That's the English word. So when they translated, Swami Vivekananda translated the Satchidananda, he translated as existence absolute, consciousness absolute, bliss absolute. Just to distinguish it from relative existence, relative consciousness and relative bliss. What is relative bliss? Ah, we had wonderful cookies. I was very joyful, delicious. That relative bliss comes from the cookie. Vedanta says it doesn't come from the cookie. It comes from yourself because you are the essence of bliss. You project this bliss from inside out and get it back imagining that it comes from outside. <laughs> so Vedanta has a beautiful story. There was a dog which was trying to eat meat. But the poor fellow, human beings are so selfish, they took all the meat and only bones were left. <laughs> the dog was still crushing and licking and trying to get something out of the bones. When it was biting too hard, its tongue was badly bruised, started bleeding. The blood got mixed with the bone next time and licking it was getting a wonderful taste. <laughs> then the dog thought that taste is from the outside which is the bone. He did not know it is from himself. So all the bliss that you experience in this world is coming from your own self. There are two, three other words which also you should know for existence Consciousness, bliss, sat, chit, ananda. Sat is called asti. Asti means existence. Asti. And chit is bhati, b-h-a-t-i. And it is priya. So there is a beautiful verse in the Panchadashi, it is a great Advaitic text. Asti bhati priyam rupam nama rupam cha panchakam. Only five things you need to know. One is asti bhati priya, the other is nama and rupa. Adyatayam brahma rupam, the first three are the characteristics of Brahman, and the last two characterize the world, Jagat. That's all. Nothing else that you need to know. Asti, Bhati, Priyam and Nama, Rupa. All that you need to know. This Priyatva which gives you joy which can be translated as dearness. Somebody is very dear to you. Somebody is Priya. The dearness idea and the idea of somebody being a source of great joy for you comes because you yourself are a source of joy. It's a beautiful discussion in Brahma Brahmaranyaka Upanishad. 
Yagya Valkya was a great sage there. He tells his wife, Maitri, so in the earlier days, how the husband used to educate the wife in spiritual knowledge. Yagya Valkya wanted to walk away in the path of sannyasa, renunciation. Then he calls his wife, now I am going to give away all my property, bequeath your property to you and walk away. Your present day, how much property are you going to give me? <laughs> Good, you go. This wife was so strange, she said, you are going to give me all this? Yeah, I have so much of property. I will bequeath all my property to you and walk away as a, a, a sitting monk. Then she said, stop, wait for some time. The wealth that you are going to bequeath to me, through that wealth, can I attain immortality? Can I attain spiritual knowledge, which will emancipate me from the bondage of time and space, body and mind? Yagya Valka said, no. This wealth will give you a very beautiful, good life. You can be happy, you can enjoy. But this will not lead you to immortality. Then the famous statement by Baitri, which is at the bedrock of all spiritual wisdom in India. He said, what is the use of that knowledge? What is that kind of wealth which will not lead me to immortality? Teach me that knowledge by which I can get, become immortal. Then Yagya Valkya said, you have been so dear to me as a wife all my life. But now, through this question, you have become much dearer than you were. I will teach you now. There's a mortal passage there. There he says, it is not the husband loves the wife, not because of the wife, but because of the priyatva, the dearness of the Atman. The wife loves the husband back, not because of the husband, because of the dearness of the Atman. Everything becomes beloved to us, not because of the objects themselves, but because of the Atman, which is the source of all joy. Nava are patyukka maya patipriyo bhavatya patipriyo bhavatya nava are jaya e kamaya jaya priya bhavatya panastu kamaya jaya priya bhavati nava are sarvasya kamaya sarvam priyam bhavatya panastu kamaya sarvam priyam bhavati atmava are drashtavyo Shrotavyo mantavyo nididhyasitavya. So, this Atman, which is joy, which is existence, which is consciousness, has to be realized. How? By shravana, manana, nididhyasana. This is called the sadhana, techniques. First, you hear about this. All of you are here on a sunny, beautiful Saturday morning. To listen to something which you feel is necessary for you to give meaning to your life. Hear about this. Constantly saturate your mind and consciousness with the higher thoughts. Then reflect upon them. Go deep into them. When the reflection becomes deeper and deeper and deeper, you lapse into a state of consciousness within you in which there is no more thought. Reflection involves the mind and thought. You, in, it's called Nididhyasana, which is a kind of Samadhi, in which you just simply get lost into that. So, Shravana, Manana, Nididhyasana, these are the techniques which are used. So, I, as the Asmat Pratyaya Gochara, and you, as the Yushmat Pratyaya, we have now realized and understood all that they call you, the other, is Nama Rupa, and what I call I is Asti Bhati Priya or Sat Chit Ananda Swarupa. We have come up to that point. Now we inquire who is the I which is called Sat Chit Ananda Swarupa? As I said, Triputi, the knower, the known, and knowledge. If you focus on the known, which is the object, you get into science, or in spiritual world, focusing on the known as a spiritual entity, as Ishvara, as God, is called Bhakti. We spoke about this yesterday. What does Bhakti do? 
I am a Jeeva and I worship an Ishvara. Ishvara is the embodiment of all qualities. He is compassionate, he is merciful, he is, he is full of knowledge and he is luminous. That Ishvara I am worshipping, I pour my heart out, out of love. Vedanta says, Jnana says that love which you pour out is in the very nature of Ishvara. Ishvara is not out there as the other, as the known, but is your own self. So the slight turning back into yourself, you go and encounter the Ishvara thinking that he is out there, little realizing that Ishvara is your own self. Focusing the out, the known as the Ishvara, is the path of bhakti which are outward focused. <coughs> Focusing on the knower is the path of knowledge, jnana. Just you reflect it here. And in the extreme blending of these two, you realize you focus, in, focus on the outside as Ishvara because you want to love him, you want to worship him, you want to feed him. You want to be related to him as a child, as a, as a friend, as a beloved. Now you take him back into your heart and then know he is your own self. So the interplay of bhakti and jnana, by which you see the known as an object, which is God, and you realize that he is not an object, he is your own subject. You come back. So you inquire into who is the I, the knower. I inquire into the known, as Ishvara, through Bhakti. And then I want to find out who is the knower, the focusing into the knower. I said there are three, the knower, the known and knowledge. You may ask, you could and should ask, what about the third component? Suppose I focus on none of these two. I focus not on the known, not on the knower. I focus on just knowledge which is in between then I'll have no need for Ishvara whom I should love through Bhakti. No known the Atman whom I should know through knowledge. I will just stick to awareness. This is exactly what Buddha did. What Buddha did was, I said I have no need for an Ishvara because I have not seen him, I have not known him. I have realized that there is no I within because when I go into myself, I see no I at all. So why do you posit an Atman? Anatta and Nirishvara. What a great spiritual genius he must have been to posit a religion without God and soul. Religion means God and soul. So what he did was catch hold of the awareness. That's why Buddhistic religion is so scientific. In the modern world, you, you don't worry about God, you don't worry about the soul. Carl Jung, the famous uh, psychologist, wrote a book, Modern Man in Search of a Soul. <laughs> modern Man Searching a Soul, which he is unable to find. So hold on to knowledge which is awareness, jnana. Focusing on jnata is knowledge, is jnana. Advaita, focusing on the known Ishvara, called Bhakti, and focusing on the knowledge, which means you defocus everything. There's no focusing on knowledge is a vast ocean. So defocusing of everything, just remaining with knowledge purely, the pure awareness is the Buddhistic method, which is now called the Zen. <laughs> it's not easy, we talk about Zen. <laughs> Zen comes from Jnana. Jnana is Jnana, Jnana is Zen. The Zen Buddhists teach you, just remain with awareness. So people who practice awareness, just practice awareness, go to sleep. <laughs> I think we're giving a lot. If we were to conceptualize it, Marge, can we just put here, if we could do this? You put Novar, Known. Well, what about if we put yeah, Ishwara? Ishwara? Okay, and then we put Knower. Knower, known. And as you're saying here, 
path from Ishwar to the focusing of Jiva to Ishwar. That is, is bhakti. bhakti. Yeah. Okay. The path of focusing on nowhere to known gives you knowledge, which is the process. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> and then you said the path. If of you focus on the known, it is the path of jnana. So when you focus on the known, you ask the question, who is the person who is the knower? Not the known, the knower. Who is the knower? <laughs> so this is also very important because this is all that you have. I have not seen Ishvara, I see this world. I ask myself, who is it that is knowing this world? As a scientist, I am investigating into something. I ask myself, who is the investigator? Who is the knower? Who is the eater? Who is the hearer? Who is the listener? Who is the taster? Then I said, I? Oh, I taste, I see, I know, I listen, I feel. Who is the I? Who feels? Is it the body? Is it the mind? Is, the, is this the uh, flesh and blood? Then I investigate into the nature of the knower. This is called in Sanskrit, koham. K O hyphen H O M. You write that here. Koham. Below, below this. No, ko with, with an apostrophe there above. Oh. After, no, after ko, o. Yeah. After o, uh -huh. put an apostrophe. Okay. Apostrophe above, above. Above. Uh, yeah. That is to show ko aham. The o is lupta there. <coughs> it branches into two. Put two arrows. Koham, the inquiry koham leads to. Put one and then aha, uh -huh, yeah. Yesterday we discussed what does it lead to? Yesterday we was in the path of bhakti. You go on investigating to who I am and finally realize I am nobody, God alone is. I am not the doer, God is the only doer. I am not the listener. God is the only listener. He is acting through me. I am only an instrument, a vehicle in which he manifests. So you come up with to say Naham. There is Bhakti. In double A. But one single word. No, no, no. Single word. Oh. Na, uh, na aham. Naham, not I. But I get you right, not I. You write bhakti. Koham is who am I? Koham, you write who am I? So you end up by saying, Naham, I am not there, God alone is. Then in the path of jnana, when you begin to inquire, Koham, who am I? You realize I am not that I don't exist. I am that vast infinite existence. Infinite existence, infinite knowledge, infinite bliss. So I say Soham. So with an apostrophe on the top. Yeah. So this this put on box over the whole thing. Put on box about uh, the whole no no the whole one. The whole uh, up to this, yeah. So this box you remember, you know the whole of Indian spirituality. <laughs> You begin with koham, who am I? In the path of jnana, you begin to realize I soham, I am that infinite. In the path of bhakti, you said naham, I am nobody. <laughs> Finished. That's all there is to know. This may just be semantics, Swami, but uh, we acquire knowledge from interaction with objects. But where does understanding come in? Is understanding right? is knowledge. It is knowledge. Of course, Same. it is knowledge. Right. Now, we, I want to acquire knowledge about myself. So we are acquiring knowledge about objects. The question is, spirituality asks, what is the knowledge about myself? I know everything in the universe except that person, the knowledge about that, that, that person who knows. This has been the Indian spiritual approach. I know all the objects in the universe, but I do not know the subject who knows these objects. There is a beautiful conversation in the Chandagopanishad. Narada and Sanat Kumara. 
Narada is represented a modern man full of knowledge of the outside world. Narada approaches Sanat Kumar and says, I am deeply sorrowful. Shocha me, that is the word used. I am so full of sorrow. Why? Because I have acquired so much knowledge. Those who have less knowledge are intensely happy. Some people keep on reading so many books. So full of books, I read that book and that. What do you gain? Finally, totally confused. <laughs> because they are acquiring knowledge from outside. Then he said, only we have heard from great people like you that only a person who has acquired knowledge of himself can go beyond sorrow. Tarati shokam atmavit. That one sentence is the bedrock of all Indian spiritual wisdom. Shokam, sorrow, tarati, crosses beyond atmavid as man of self-knowledge, knows about himself. Shokasya param tarayatu, please take me beyond sorrow, I can't take this sorrow anymore. Knowledge is killing me. <laughs> <laughs> Swami Vivekananda once said, How I wish I got a drug or a medicine by which I can just forget all that I have acquired, knowledge. Then one of his disciples said, But Swami, we admire you only for that. Then he smiled and said, That's because, madam, you are a fool as I am. <laughs> we get knowledge, knowledge, knowledge. Knowledge society. And acquire more and more knowledge. And ultimately, where does knowledge lead you? You become intensely unhappy. And you spend your life. I have acquired so much of knowledge, but I have no peace. This happened to Narada. Narada goes desperately to Sarat Kumara, please teach me that knowledge by which I can go beyond sorrow. Then Sarat Kumara smiles and says, please tell me child, what are the knowledge you have acquired? The huge list he gives there, the astound is staggering. Rig Veda, Yajur Veda, Sama Veda, Atharva Veda, all the four Vedas I know thoroughly. Then six Vedangas, Vedangas auxiliary to the Vedas. Shiksha, Kalpa, Vyakarana, Narukta, Chanda, Jyotish. Shiksha is the science of pronunciation. Kalpa is the ritualistic portion. Vyakarada is grammar. Nirukta is etymology and linguistics. Vyakarada, Nirukta, Chanda. Chanda is prosody. And Jyotish is astronomy. I know all that. And then so many vidyas I know, branches of knowledge. Sarpa Vidya, Nakshatra Vidya, Rashi Vidya, I know physics and chemistry and biology and statistics and political science, history, everything in the world. I have a dozen Nobel Prizes and a few hundred outstanding prizes all over the world, but I'm intensely unhappy. <laughs> then Narada cries to him, please take me beyond sorrow. Sanat Kumara smiles and says, My child, all that you have acquired is only some words and words and formulae. Namai Vaitat, he says. Namai is some formula. You have acquired some formulae, that's all. Pieces of knowledge, bits and pieces of knowledge. There is an interesting story of a small child who was very curious what his elder brother was studying. He was studying literature. Then, when the brother was not there, he was looking at the books. Shakespeare, Milton, and uh, uh, beautiful pieces of prose. Then went through all of them and told his mama, Mommy, it's all only ABCD. <laughs> what is what is the page, English page contain? From A to Z, some combination, you make a word. Combination of words, you make a sentence. Combination of sentences, you make a piece of literature. And then you say, what a wonderful writing of Shakespeare. If you reduce it ultimately, it's only from A to Z. In exactly the same way, he said, you have heard some words and formulae. Words and formulae can never satisfy you. I will teach you that spiritual knowledge or the knowledge of your own self. This has been the bedrock and the burden of the song of Indian spiritual culture. Have you acquired knowledge about yourself? Do you know who you are? Where you came from, where you go? No, sir, I do not know that, but I know everything in the universe about the external world. If that satisfies you, go ahead. But a time will come when you'll ask, who is it that I am? Where am I going? What am I doing? 
what is the purpose of human life? Where do I come from? This is called self-inquiry. Inquiry into your own self. It's called Atma Vichara. In Sanskrit, Atma means the self. Inquiry is Vichara. I inquire into myself. There is Koham. When I go into myself, <coughs> before that I was worshipping a god. I call that god Brahman. I call that god Ishwara. But Ishwara is always projecting outside of me. The Upanishadic wisdom comes and tells you that the Ishvara that you are projecting outside will never satisfy unless you realize that Ishvara is your own very self. So the Upanishad says, I am talking to you about that Brahman who is realizable as your own self and not Brahman that is out there. Tadeva Brahmatvam Vidhi Nedam Ididam Upasate. So, in a sense, there are two kinds of Brahman. One is the Upasya Brahman who you can worship as out there. You have a picture. This is Ramakrishna's picture. This is Radha Sarda's picture. This is the picture of Jesus Christ. This is the picture of Buddha. And you offer flowers, you offer incense, you offer fruits, and you offer sweets. Of course, you get them back. <laughs> it's called prasada. If God ate away everything, nobody would offer him. <laughs> I have a funny incident occurred in, when I went to Sydney. I didn't know actually. I took some uh, uh, prasad from Belurmat, where I came from. It's considered very sacred. I thought our monastic brothers and swamis are there. Let me take some prasad for them. There are some sweets. Then you have to declare in Australia is very particular. Do you have some eatables? Do you have some uh, um, uh, plants, herbs and so on? I simply think, no, no, no. I forgot actually. Then in the scanning, they found this a box there, opened this. What is this? I said, it is to be eaten? I said, yes. You know what you have declared? I know. Do you know what is the punishment for this? You will be instantly jailed. Because false declaration. But somehow I, didn't, I was not afraid. I said, you see, this is a sacramental food. We call it prasada in India. <laughs> what is that? <laughs> we offer this to God. God sends us back to us. <laughs> comes from God? Yes, it comes directly from God. <laughs> All right, take it. Don't do it again. <laughs> So we say there is a God whom you can worship and offer. That God, there is bhakti. But Jnana says that God who you are worshipping is your own self. So you, that God is only your own self reflected and projected outside. Just for the sake of worship, for fun you may project him outside. But remember he is your own self. That Brahman we are worshipping, worship is called Upasana. Upasana means, asana means sitting, upa means near, sitting near God. You sit near him, you do puja, offer flowers, incense, offer some sweets and get it back of course, quickly get it back. <laughs> so this is called upasana, called upasya brahman. Upasya means a brahman or a god who is worshipped. There is another kind of brahman, Shankara says, who is gay brahman. Gay means that brahman who is known as your own self who is realized as your own self. So Upanishad says, the Jnana path says, we are not interested in the Upasya Brahman who is projected outside, but we are interested in the Gaya Brahman who is realizable as your own very self. What is the advantage? The advantage is you are, not, you are totally independent. Even in the path of Bhakti, you are hopelessly dependent on a God who sometimes ditches you. Oh God, I cried so much, but you didn't do anything for me. Because we think God should do something which according to my plan. <laughs> we have a plan for ourselves. And we show it to God and want to get it approved through Him. God says, I have my own plan. Allow me to function. <laughs> so there's a very a clever way of going to God and getting it done through Him. 
But as long as I depend on anything outside, I will be in misery. So the path of Jnana says, you cannot escape misery and fear as long as you depend on something else outside, even if it be God. So Vedanta says, Jnana says, that God on which you are depending helplessly for your help, yesterday I was talking about Bhakti, don't get confused. Now I no, will talk as a pure Jnani. <laughs> Swamiji once said, would to God I were never born in this dualistic devotional superstition. <laughs> He was talking as a, as a pure jnani. Swamiji was once challenged. Are you a jnani or advaitist? He said, yes. But when I have a stomach ache, I call on God. <laughs> 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 that means, as long as you feel identified with the body-mind complex, you need a God who will protect you. But remember that God you are worshipping is your own self. In India, this is a fundamental doctrine that the God you are worshipping through bhakti is also your own self. There are some beautiful stotras, hymns composed by Shankara where he says, O oh God, I worship you, I offer flowers, I offer incense. And in India, they think of God as an existing human being and then show affection, they, they prepare bed for him. They put him to bed, shayana, put him to bed, they fan him. <laughs> as if he is real and he is for many of them. And then says, I do all that and then finally ask for your forgiveness because I thought you were outside me without realizing you are here now. So the Upasya Brahman which is worshipping God worshipped outside has to be repositioned into your own heart and realize he is your own self. The, your own self is called Atman. The Atman is a word which is given to that self which is beyond the mind and the body and senses. The pure spirit called consciousness, what we call the Chit here in the Sachidananda, that Chit in the microcosmic form in your own body is called the Atman. Now, what about the world outside? Is he without God? Is it without God? Is it not conscious? The Vedanta says, Jnana says, no, it's also pervaded by the same consciousness. Somebody was asking this the, 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 uh, in the coffee break. What about the world outside? Is it unconscious? It's also saturated with the same consciousness. Isha vasyam idam sarvam mitkinja jagatyam jagat. Isha vasya upanishad. Envelop this entire universe with the same consciousness principle. It's called Vishwa Chaitanya, Virat Chaitanya, huge consciousness outside. There is no outside and inside ultimately. When we say outside and inside, it's with reference to the body. Do you appreciate that? What is outside? outside? With reference to the body, we say inside and outside. With reference to the room, we say inside the room, outside the room. There is no inside and outside ultimately. As long as you feel you have a body, you have to say inside and outside. Now the Vishwa Chaitanya which is animating this entire universe, pervading the universe, we call it Brahman. The word used is Brahman because it is big. The word for the consciousness which is animating me inwardly, which is possessing me and living in my heart and manifesting as my speech, as my eyes, as my knowledge, is called Atman. Now the question is asked, what is the relation between the Atman and Brahman? The Brahman which is all pervading entity outside and the consciousness which is within me called the Atman, are they identical? Is this Brahman part of that infinite consciousness? Or is it Brahman, is this Atman eternally subordinate to that Atman as a separate entity? Three different schools, you know them, Advaita, Vishishta Advaita and Dvaita, Monism called non-dualism, qualified non-dualism and dualism. You may think of God as the supreme entity, the infinite consciousness. My consciousness is eternally subordinate to him, dependent upon him, not different from him, but it can't claim I am the same entity. Another school of thought, you are a part of God. You 
in here in god you participate in the consciousness of god example you have cells in the body each cell is an independent unit but the entire body of cells in the body constitutes the body so in exactly the same way you as an individual little consciousness participate in the entire infinite consciousness of god you are a part of him and he is the whole this is called vishishta advaita advaita says how can consciousness of parts the logic conscious can't be broken this is a small big this is the tiny conscious this is a big conscious how can they be big and small why not because consciousness by definition is absolute if it is absolute it has to be infinite can infinity be broken if infinity is broken it is not infinite it is finite akhandam khandyate katham avadud gita akhanda infinite can't be broken into fragments and it can't be broken into fragments then it has to be one with my infinite consciousness as i discussed yesterday if it is absolute it has to be infinite if it is infinite it has to be beyond time and space and is infinite it has to be one because there are two infinities both of them will become i have to be that infinite consciousness i am that infinite consciousness the guru gives you this knowledge advaita may wish away ishvara but it can't wish away the guru <laughs> jiva jagat ishvara with which we began this morning according to advaita jiva jagat and ishvara enjoy the same status how as long as the jiva exist and feel himself to be real the jagat exists as real and the ishvara is a reality whom he worships if the jiva ceases to be jagat ceases and ishvara also ceases so the bhakti acharyas are very unhappy oh don't don't drive away ishvara ishvara god i think should not be driven away he says no i am not driving away god when i am not there god is not there jiva jagat ishvara either rise together or fall together so jishvara is considered in the path of jnana as he as swami vekananda says highest reading of the absolute the, through the relative lens through the lens of relativity space time causation if you read the absolute the highest manifestation is ishvara and the manifestation of ishvara as an incarnation as an avatar which we discussed yesterday is one of the outstanding manifestations but if a pure jnani you will say ishvara jiva which is me and the jagat which i see all the three of them have the same status they rise together or they fall together and that i which i was inquiring through koham who am i i end up by saying i am that infinite consciousness soham there is a simple uh, poetic analogy which was given in the ramakrishna literature by a great poet and a dramatist called girish chandra ghosh he was a bohemian disciple of ramakrishna as you know he gave a wonderful analogy he said mahamaya you know mahamaya i don't know mahamaya is that world enchantress woman she all the time catches people to divert them away from god <laughs> the funny thing is she wants everybody to be outwardly focused so that nobody realizes the infinite that's the game just a way of saying that me, human beings are always outward focused so this world entrances mahamaya through a net to catch human beings into the bondage of time space and causation two beings escaped one became so tiny so small so micro scopically small that the net could not hold him he escaped the other became so big that the net couldn't hold him the first person was a person who was a bhakta the 
Bhakta says, Naham. When you want to catch him, hey, I'll catch you in your net. The eye itself doesn't exist. How can you catch the non-existent eye? The eye simply escapes. It becomes so small, eye simply gets erased so that you escape. Soham, the huge eye, which identifies itself as the infinite consciousness, can't be caught in the net because there's no big net to be able to catch it. This is jnana. So both of them are identical. One is the zero, the other is infinity. <laughs> Shunya and Purna, as they call it in Vedanta. <coughs> what you call zero is the same as infinity. Either you reduce your ego to such an extent that the ego completely vanishes, or you expand your ego to such an extent it encompasses the entire universe. There is nothing else apart from you, and the ego is realized as the infinite consciousness. Soham was Swami Vivekananda, who became so vast that the Mahamaya couldn't catch him. Naham is Nag Mahasaya, a householder disciple of Ramakrishna, Durga Charan Nag, was so humble, so simple, so self-effacing that he couldn't be caught. You choose any of these two paths. Or if you're intelligent, have play between these two. Sometimes you have Soham, sometimes you have Naham. Sometimes you are on the path of bhakti, you cry to God and you feel so, oh God, please help me. And come back and say, oh God, come into my heart and sit there, I am you. <laughs> Why not play both? Sri Ramakrishna says, there is a great joy in playing between these two. When you want to love that God, Jnani cannot love God, there is no God of love. So you become so dry. He always seems so hum. And then he can't smile, he's always very serious about it. And the bhakta is always smiling because you're playing with God. He knows God will take care, like a child playing with the, <laughs> the mother. But he knows he's completely erased himself. But unless he has the awareness that that God who he's playing with is his own very self, you'll always feel afraid that God will never run away. There's a book, The God That Went Away. God which goes, there's a book. So God cannot go away because he's always in your heart. So real bhakta says, Oh God, you can't escape me because you are in my heart all the time. Highest bhaktas have completely arrested God in their heart. And God finally says, Oh, I am so sad, I am your slave. A bhakta, a devotee, has completely caught me in his net. <laughs> because out of love. So if you intensely love somebody, that person cannot leave you so easily. I have caught you in your net of my love. These are great sentiments. There's a story in Mahabharata. You know, Sri Krishna and the Kurukshetra war, you know, the, the Gita teaching was there in the Kurukshetra war. Sri Krishna very, was a very interesting person. He was a jnani, bhakta, yogi, and always all the time mischievous and playing around. So charming, difficult to understand him. He goes around asking everybody, how to prevent this war, can you tell me? There are two characters in the Mahabharata among the Pancha Pandavas. There are five Pandavas, as you know. Arjuna was a great warrior. Bhima, the muscle man. <laughs> Yudhishthira, the calm, sattvic person, was the head. And two others, younger brothers, Nakula and Sahadeva. The great jnanis, men of great wisdom. So Krishna goes to Sahadeva. Can you tell me, give me a hint about how to prevent war? Sahadeva smiles and says, there are two things which you should do. Shave away Draupadi's hair. Draupadi was the wife of the Panchapandavas. She had pledged that Dushasana was insulting her by trying to disrobe her. She said, she should be killed, my hair will be smeared with his blood, then only I will tie my hair. Draupadi's hair is creating all problems, shave it off. And you should be put under arrest. You, Krishna, when you are outside the jail, you will always create problems. Interesting story. Then Krishna said, the first thing can be easily done by paying a few dollars to the barber. But can you do the, can anybody arrest me? In the three worlds, is there anybody who can put me under arrest? Then Sahadeva says, are you taking the challenge? Here you go sat deep in meditation, 
put Sri Krishna in his heart and bound him with the rope of love. And Sri Krishna says, please release me, I am arrested. <laughs> that is the great sentiment of bhakti. Aham there he says, Aham bhakta paradhi, you know, asvatantraiva. I am a slave of a devotee and I have no independence. The devotee can simply arrest me and tie me with the rope of his love. So we can play both. That God who I am worshipping is my own self. Now, now and then I play in the infinite Satchidananda. Sri Ramakrishna was taught by his great Advaita Guru, Totapuri. Some of the impersonal meditations are very useful. Personal God, you worship him and then show incense and all that. But sometimes you can try the other thing also. One type of meditation. Sri Ramakrishna was taught by Totapuri. You think of yourself as a fish swimming happily in the infinite ocean of Satchidananda. Infinite, formless ocean of absolute bliss, absolute consciousness, absolute existence. Satchidananda. And you are a fish who are happily moving around. You can see the sea world if you want. <laughs> How the fish are happily moving around. Imagine yourself be a fish swimming in the ocean of Satchidananda. Or imagine yourself to be a bird flying happily in the infinite vast sky of Satchidananda. Huge sky, infinite sky. Expansive. Then your bird moving around like that. So these are some of the meditations you can practice to show, to realize that you are bodiless. Why it is important to practice jnana along with the bhakti is because bhakti may make you sentimental and make you attached to your own body. Why? Because you are constantly concentrating on the form of the Ishwara. And you are saying Ishwara should be fed like that, Ishwara should be clothed like this, Ishwara should be given this kind of incense, this kind of flower. Constantly concentrating in the form of the Ishwara, you will make your own form much stronger. To be able to realize that you are formless, which is your true nature, now and then you should try to depersonalize the Ishwara by depersonalizing your own self. Otherwise, you will once again become sentimental, get caught. Those who are devotees without jnana, they become sentimental, they become attached to people. The attachment to people comes because I believe my form is true, because the God's form is true, and then all the forms here are true. <laughs> I become sentimental, I become emotional. So you go to jnana, the danger in jnana, you become very dry. <laughs> all the time you are impersonal. You have no God of love. See, man cannot live unless he has the feeling of love which is expressed. The infinite Satchitananda, how can I love that infinite Satchitananda? Infinite, vast, expired, oh Satchitananda, I am pouring my heart in love. Satchitananda doesn't react, simply standing still like that. It doesn't smile. Though Satchitananda make it a human form, or the form of a god or a goddess, I pour my heart. So play with this. Swami Vivekananda therefore says, knowledge is dry. It becomes, and becomes intellectual. Remember, jnana is not intellect. Jnana is not intellectual. This is another important point which I want to tell you. Bhakti participates of the heart. Jnana equally arises in the heart and not in the brain, not in the head. We always think jnana is the head and bhakti is the heart. No. There is an entity called the heart with a capital H called Hridaya in Sanskrit, from which arise all spirituality. And to be able to realize the heart is the essence of spiritual life. Christian mystics also have spoken about this. The prayer of the heart. Hridaya. Hridaya or heart. Grace with a capital G. God, Atma, Brahman. All of them are synonymous. The realization of the self takes place in the heart. There is a verse in the Kathopanishad, Hrida Manisha Manasa Bhiklupto Yaye Tad Vidura Murtas Te Bhavanti. Hrida through the heart, 
Manisha through the intellect and Manasa through the mind. We talked about Annamaya, Pranamaya, Manomaya, Vijnanamaya, Anandamaya yesterday. The heart is the Vijnanamaya. Just like you can talk about the uh, five uh, states. In America, you call them 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. In India, following the British pattern, we call it 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. The ground floor, first floor, second floor, third floor. We call it first floor, second floor, third floor. Let us follow the American pattern. The Annamaya 1, Pranamaya 2, Manomaya 3, Vijnanamaya 4, Anandamaya 5. Beyond that is the infinite, Satchidananda. So in spiritual life, we get into the elevator. As long as you are moving between 1, 2, 3, spiritual life has not begun. Annamaya, Pranamaya, Manomaya. Usually what we do is, press 2, have a lot of fun, eat, drink, Pranamaya. Sometimes you go to 3, go to the library, read a lot of books, write articles which nobody understands or reads, <laughs> publish books. At the mental level you are very happy. 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3. Spiritual life begins when you go to 4. Vijnanamaya. So the Sadguru, the spiritual teacher tells you, come with me. Press 4. Sir, I've never pressed 4 in my life. I'll tell you press 4. Third floor, going up, the elevator tells you, then you reach the fourth floor, which is Vijnana. You enter the third floor, you see so much great light, the light of consciousness. We spoke about the light of consciousness as a Atma Prakasha, Swayam Jyoti. Don't think they are all imaginations or only uh, stories. One can actually intuit the books say, not I, don't think I have realized it. The books say, the scriptures say, the teachers say, the documented evidence in the Upanishads say, you can actually see that divine light. What is the difference between this light and that light? When you see that light, you will know that you are that light. It is not an objective light. Your own light of consciousness you realize is this eternal subject. Called Atma Jyoti. I told you about the Yagya Valka Sambhada just now. Janaka asks, what is the light by which you function? Finally he says, by the Atma Jyoti. Then he says, what is that Atma Jyoti? Katama Atmeti Yo Yam Vigyana Mayav Praneshu Hridyantar Jyoti It is a Hridhi Antar Jyoti. In the Hridaya, there is Antar Jyoti. Proof all of us experience some light. Do you know when? Inward light. When we see dreams. What is the light by which we see dreams? Can you tell me? There is no external light. But we do see objects in dream clearly in some light. Which is proof enough that there is an inner light. And the Upanishad says that light is the light of consciousness which is Atma Jyoti. But don't be satisfied with that. This light is a pale reflection of an infinite light which is beyond it. That's called Jyotisham Jyoti, Jyoti Ra Jyoti, light of all lights. Then you see the whole thing is bright. Then awakens in you, according to Jnana path, a faculty called Medha. When you enter that fourth floor, Welcome to the fourth floor, sir. There are people who wait and welcome you. An angelic goddess, luminous goddess will be waiting there and as you. Welcome, enter the fourth floor, the Vigyanamaya. Her name is Medha Devi, the goddess of Medha, the higher intelligence, by which we'll be able to intuit higher faculties, spiritual faculties. It's called Medha, it's called Pragya. It is called Dhi, it is called Hridaya Guha, it is called Buddhi. So many words are used. In the Yoga Sutra, the word Pragya is used. It is called Pragya Loka. The Aloka means the light, light of Pragya. 
कारण ऋतंभरा प्रज्ञा ऋतंभरा श्यूरिटी सर्टनिटी ट्रूथफुलनेस इट्स अ ट्रू लाइट विच यूज एक्चुअली सी दिस इज नॉट स्टोरीज पीपल हैव एक्सपीरियंस्ड इट क्रिश्चियन मिस्टिक्स कॉल इट अनक्रिएटेड लाइट एंड लाइट इज अ फॉर्म एनीथिंग विच हैज अ फॉर्म शुड बी अकॉमडेड बाई अ नेम नेम एंड फॉर्म इज इंसपरेबल नेम इज अ साउंड एंड दिस एक्सपीरियंस ऑफ द लाइट ऑफ कॉन्शियसनेस योगीज से ज्ञानीज से इज अकॉम्पनीड बाय द हियरिंग ऑफ अ साउंड हाउ इज साउंड प्रोड्यूस्ड I strike one against the other sound is no sound unless there is a strike sound can't be produced and what happens to a sound which is produced by striking it begins it ends but if there is if there is a sound which is produced without striking unstruck sound that can't have a beginning or an end in sanskrit striking is called ahata that which strikes that which is unstruck is called anahata anahata dhvani always accompanies the vision of the uncreated light that's the experience of uh, yogis and gyanis when the mind sri ramakrishna also says in the gospel when the kundalini awakens and reaches the uh, uh, chakra of the heart anahata chakra then you see a mysterious light and say oh what is this light what is this light and it is accompanied by sound which is the om the pranava mantra the om is the unstruck sound the anahata dhvani since it is unstruck it has no beginning and no end since there is no beginning and no end it should be eternal if it is eternal it should be beyond time and space therefore it should be constantly rising in this universe this has been called by the greek mystics as the music of the spheres every culture has experienced this this music of the spheres is constantly rising in this universe it may be like a flute which you are playing this morning some kind of mysterious light comes within you and when you hear this light see this light and hear this some mysterious anahata dhvani you are first time tasting experiencing the spiritual realm these are not no words this is not simply theory first you realize yourself as a spirit apart from the body now after having realized this you walk out of the elevator fourth floor don't go up come out of the elevator and there's a corridor which is full of light and the medha devi is sitting there will tell you exit no baggage claim because you have no baggage you walk down walk down the whole thing is full of light then there is written there wait hiranyagarbha there is the cosmic consciousness you have been so far confined to the individual hridaya the heart which is the vigyanamaya atman of the individual you entered it through the first door 1 2 3 4 going up you have reached the fourth floor now exit then the gps will tell you gps is the guru will tell you for 15 minutes walk straight you walk straight the whole thing is full of light then take a turn to the left way to hiranyagarbha then the guru stands there and says welcome my child to hiranyagarbha hiranyagarbha is the cosmic consciousness cosmic mind which is the luminous mind not the ordinary mind is called samashti buddhi upahita chaitanya there is a technical term which is used chaitanya is consciousness upahita covered by 
samashti buddhi that vast aggregate of all the buddhi of the entire universe the samashti buddhi upayata chaitanya is called hiranyagarbha in vedanta in sankhya it is called mahat this is the first offshoot of avyakta or prakriti there's a great verse in the kathopanishad indriyebhya parahyartha arthebhyascha param manah manasastu para buddhi buddhi ratma mahan parah ad buddhi is the individual vigyanamaya mahan atma is the mahat mahat param avyaktam avyakta is the prakriti avyakta purusha para the supreme consciousness who is the brahman shankara says in the bhashya what is mahat avyakta prathamam jatam hairanyagarbham tatvam that principle of hiranyagarbha which is the first offshoot of avyakta then first you find yourself you are self in a cosmic world of the spirit you become identified with the entire universe this has been the experience which has been vouched by all the mystics of all the worlds you feel you are no longer a limited small entity you encompass the whole universe then you think i am so big so great i am like a mountain then the rishi sings aham vrikshasya reriva kirti prishtham gireriva urdhva pavitro vajaneva samrtam asmi amrtakam suvarchasam sumedha amrtokshitah iti trishankor vedan vachanam trishanko was a great rishi he suddenly realized his cosmic identity so oh i am so big like a mountain my fame my great glory is indescribably vast then you lose your individual identity in that cosmic identity you feel you are the great ocean of satchidananda then from the hiranyagarbha you have to still go up so look at the higher and higher layers which your indian spiritual wisdom has reached even that is not enough hiranyagarbha has been intuited many of the scientists also i was talking about carl jung the great psychologist there's a very powerful scientist called wolfgang pauli he was a heard of the pauli's exclusion principle and so on he was a genius of a scientist very young he got a nobel prize pauli and jung have been collaborating on the hiranyagarbha project you can look up in the google very interesting how these great because all the great ideas have come coming from hiranyagarbha hiranyagarbha is the repository of all the ideas which have been generated by the human mind from time immemorial from the beginning of creation it is a kind of huge archive of ideas and if you want any idea simply download from hiranyagarbha <laughs> and a human mind which is constantly in touch with the hiranyagarbha is called an illumined mind the hiranyagarbha is called the ishvara hiranyagarbha is called the cosmic consciousness hiranyagarbha is called the virat and hiranyagarbha is called devata or a shining one this is the loka of the avatara if you want to meet christ followers of christ will go to hiranyagarbha and see christ called the kingdom of heaven followers of shiva will go to hiranyagarbha in the form of kailash and then shiva will be there sitting there followers of vishnu will go to vaikuntha which is hiranyagarbha and the followers of ramakrishna will go to the ramakrishna loka which has been recently created about a, about 150 years ago in the hiranyagarbha now pure gyani is say no i am not satisfied even there there is name and form see as long as you have name and form you are limited pure gyani is will say no there may be god god may be compassionate god may be luminous god may have all the things in the world but i do not want a god with name and form then god himself says oh you are not satisfied go up from there enter in the elevator special elevator there and then say enter in the four you are already in four press going up then you go to four don't don't exit there 
when you exert you find the vast infinite there is no cosmic individual counterpart for the arandamaya arandamaya itself is cosmic and you may be satisfied with that but shankara we say don't be satisfied with even that go still beyond then you go to the infinite which is beyond the arandamaya and what happens is anybody's guess you enter into the infinite ocean in which you are lost your individuality doesn't exist you are one with the cosmic reality and if god so wills you may be given a return ticket to come back up to hiranyagarbha for the good of the world because if you get lost who will inform this to the world so you say oh you are ramakrishna you are jesus all right you have a special pass to go back again to hiranyagarbha preach this message this is called you know what's it called gospel gospel means a good message good news jesus comes back again from the infinite to hiranyagarbha luminous charged with the power of the infinite and then says i have a gospel for all of you come unto me ye that are weary and heavy laden and i shall give thee rest and the rishis of your said shrunvantu vishve amritasya putraha all of you were the children of immortal bliss come on i have a good news for you you can become divine participate in the infinity see when you think about all this even imagining this is so blissful and so elevating if you can realize it how wonderful it will be these are the various layers which you have talked about and shankara will say don't compromise with anything short of nameless and formless and when you go there you realize all that i went there the first, the first floor and second floor third floor all of them are here within me these are not floors outside swami atishwaranda has a beautiful book adventures in religious life there is a special chapter secret stairs to super consciousness <laughs> that is the fourth floor there you have a special staircase and then you enter it for a bhakta for a devotee in the path of bhakti he says i don't understand all this complicated theology fourth floor third floor hiranyagarbha you go to god oh god i don't understand please give me the knowledge of hiranyagarbha he says come on i'll give you take it it's given as a gift for a gyani he says i want to explore myself there's an adventure there then he goes on gave going adventure for a gyana bhakti combined in our case in the case of ramakrishna sometimes you explore sometimes you go it is going for a mountaineering expedition i want to climb up everest i want to climb at the peak of spiritual consciousness you go come back but you don't come back below 4 none of these people operate from any position below the fourth floor which is hiranyagarbha so go up and forth and the entire world gets the benefit so this is the secret of gyana where you realize yourself as one with the infinite and you realize yourself as the vast spiritual entity and some of the extreme gyanis have said no why do you worry about brahman the atman itself is the vast infinite entity don't worry about the brahman out there as being one with yourself explore into your own consciousness they realize i am that infinite consciousness from which the entire world has sprung ashtavakra samhita is one one such text extreme advaitic and gyana text swami vivekananda was given a dose of advaita by sri ramakrishna through the ashtavakra samhita at that time narayan was heavily conditioned by the brahma samaj thinking himself as a puny little creature before the majesty of the king of kings who was god ramakrishna put this current into him and that narayan who said i am a beggar in the street and you are the king of kings how can i ask you to come and stay in my heart tumi tribhuvana nath ami bikhari anath kemono boli bo tumai esho mama hrudaye you are the king of kings i am that worthless despicable beggar in the street how can i say oh lord please come and stay in my heart that narain who said that from the world pulpit he proclaimed 
never forget the glory of human nature buddha son christ are but the waves of the infinite ocean which i am <laughs> he struck his chest i am the infinite ocean of consciousness from which so many jivas and beings and worlds arise and fall i am the infinite ocean mai ananta maham bodho aascharyam jiva vichaya udjanti ghranti khelanti pravishanti swabhavatah i am the infinite ocean of consciousness in which wave after wave of worlds and beings sentient and insentient jivas are rising and falling and they getting merged i am the infinite ocean when you realize that what happens to you the final punch vedanta says you become sarva bhuta hiterata you become so full of compassion so full of love for the entire humanity you want to embrace them in the infinite ocean of consciousness of love there is nobody apart from you and your love and compassion flows out in a thousand streams towards the whole world of being sentient and insentient and you become a blessing to humanity shankaracharya says vasanta val lokahitam charanta like a gentle breeze which blows and then gives so much of joy and coolness to hundreds of beings his very presence is a blessing to humanity and that person who has identified himself the cosmic spirit with flowing compassion and love he is called the avatar he is called a man of god and you and i now and here can attain the state of consciousness that is the challenge of vedanta jnani says it is not a monopoly of anybody you have the kingdom of god within you and you can now do it don't wait till your body falls and you die we do not want a post mortem experience <laughs> we want an experience now and here ihaiva ihaiva that word is used in the gita ihaiva tarjita sargo esham samye sthitam mana nirdosham me samam brahma tasmat brahmanite sthita ihaiva now here i want to realize this state 519 can you put that oh you know it's not there 519 523 two places in the gita ihaiva occurs there you have a means now and here i can do this that is the great challenge and there's a great hope now sitting here but take lunch but not before that <laughs> you can enter the great infinite ocean of consciousness nothing is lost this world remains as it is you don't escape from this world you don't run away from this world the entire world appears deified and filled with god all the human faces which you see all the animals and plants which you see all of them appear to be shining with the divine consciousness and your whole life becomes a blessing what happens to him let me just finish with this mantra of taitri upanishad etadannamaya atmanam upasankramati etat pranamaya atmanam upasankramati etan manomaya atmanam upasankramati etad vigyanamaya atmanam upasankramati etad anandamaya atmanam upasankramati kamanni kamarupyanu sancharan etat samagayan naste start singing for joy you can contain that joy ha u ha u ha u ahamannam 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 ahamannado ahamannado ahamannada ahag shloka krit ahag shloka krit ahag shloka krit oh i am the infinite bliss i am the infinite consciousness i am the infinite existence and i am the source from which the entire thing has sprung up i am this entire world of matter i am this entire world of spirit i am the entire world of beings i am the anna i am the matter i am the enjoyer of matter i am the person who is making a link between matter and spirit i am the infinite consciousness he dances for sheer joy and the entire world participates in his grand dance of the spirit thank you
So I just finished at one. Yes. Yes. Uh, so now we will open it up to questions. If you have any questions, please just wait for the microphone and then I'll yeah. wait for it to come to you. Microphone. So let everybody dance now. Yeah. <laughs> I just want to, um, you know, I, I post these videos on the website and every once in a while, it's happened several times, I get a comment from somebody in India saying, why all this talk about religion? The Vedanta is a philosophy, not a religion. What's your response? <coughs> See, so many words you use, it's a philosophy, it's a theology, it's a metaphysics, it's a religion. <coughs> My own personal take on this is, you don't call it philosophy or religion or metaphysics or theology, it is just an inquiry into the present state of affairs in which we found ourselves. It's a simple inquiry into our daily experience. And when you try to analyze your daily experience and interpret it and talk about it, you come out with so many kinds of explanations. Philosophy is something which is a quest for knowledge. Religion is something which you practice. In Vedanta, it is both religion and philosophy. It is not a mere philosophical approach. You can't be a Vedantist and be a great professor of Vedanta without being a practitioner of Vedanta. In India, at least, you can't do that. I am a great professor of Vedanta. I can tell you exactly the description of the Nirguna Brahman. But in your daily life, you cut other people's throats and your intention is selfish. It is not acceptable in India. In India, Vedanta philosophy has to be a philosophy which should percolate your life. <laughs> By religion, if you mean that, which percolates your life and being, and which is practicable, and which inspires everybody to practice it in daily life. <coughs> so in that sense, in India, we don't make a distinction between religion and philosophy. It is not a philosophy, professorial philosophical outlook. Vedanta says, you have to be selfish with a capital S. <laughs> when you realize your higher self, what is selfishness? You think you are a small self? <coughs> you are encased in the body and the mind? And I want to promote my little body, little mind, little prizes which I get from the world. And the ego feels pleased. When you realize that the ego is unreal, it is only a shadow of the infinite ego, if you call it ego at all, the infinite self, Either go through the path of Naham, and where the ego is completely zero, made zero, and you become a devotee of God, God plays through you. Or take the path of <coughs> Soham, and we realize your I, yourself is the infinite, <coughs> vast self. In that case, your selfishness, little selfishness goes away. As long as you feel you are expensive, give me some hot water. <coughs> As long as you feel you're expansive, then your selfishness will simply fade away. You want to think of yourself as a small little entity to promote your own interest. That's very, very selfish. You know, suddenly. Yeah, that's very good. Thank you. It's sugar free. Yeah. <laughs> How do I believe that this is true? Because this is doing with something infinity, which is far beyond me, and I have never realized now when I'm retired, nothing to do. How do I hold on? First of all, two questions. One is, how do I hold on to this thought from the time I get up and time I step? That is question one. Number two, how do I believe? Uh, this is true because I have not experienced <coughs> it. I read in the book, in the Gita, Sri Krishna told line by line uh, 
Uh, and a lot of this thing is beyond proven truth, because after death, <coughs> you really do not know what happened to that entity. So could you give some uh, education and learning to us <coughs> your experience? Thank you. The answer to the first question, that uh, I have not myself experienced this, and therefore, <coughs> He gave me one, I can take another. <coughs> Duality. <coughs> so your question is that I haven't really experienced this, how do I really know, how do I practice this and so on. <coughs> is it worth practicing? The answer to this is, if you really feel you don't feel it and you don't practice it, please don't practice. That means you are happy to be in sorrow, please do. See, if you want to escape from sorrow, yeah. daily life is so miserable, yes. I can't take it anymore. Okay. Then you ask certain fundamental questions. Yeah. And you have no other choice. Okay. Suppose you assume this is not true. <laughs> you know, what is the answer Vivekananda gave? By through remarkable sentences. Suddenly he got into a mood in which he said, <clears throat> looked at the audience. Where are the people who will stand in the street yonder and say that they possess nothing but God? Who will come? The sweep along the audience, everybody was absolutely quiet. Then he said, why should you be afraid? Then he said, if this is true, what else matters? If this is not true, what do our lives matter? Is the answer. If these, these things which are spoken about are true, nothing else really matters. Suppose you say, I don't know that they are true. If they are not true, do our lives have any meaning? Suppose you think that these are not true. Leave them alone. What is your life reduced to? Eating and drinking and sleeping and socializing the same rigmarole you have to wake up sometime. There are hundreds of thousands of people outside who don't wake up. They seem to be happy but they are not. All of you have come here with some awakening. Otherwise you are asking this question. Of course you do know this is true. Otherwise you would be here. But we have not realized it that it is absolutely true. There is a vague understanding of the truth of this. You realize this is something which attracts me. Because you have in yourself that infinite nature. Your consciousness is infinite. And therefore when somebody speaks about your real nature as infinite consciousness, it strikes a resonance. Ah, right. This is it. This is it. Because this is your real nature. Suppose you leave it out as untrue. What is your life? If this is true, what else matters? If this is not true, what do our lives matter? Yes, please. <clears throat> My question is a, a two parts. You talk about the knowledge. Um, what's the question? That's part one of the question. No, no, what's the question? I don't understand the question. The question is, is there anything beyond knowledge and the knower? If you take away all the knowledge and all the knower, Who takes there's away? no consciousness beyond that that's observing both the knowledge and See, what I was trying to say was the knowledge, the known, and the, and the knower are the three entities which we see, which we have, which we experience. If you say take away, who takes it away? Is it the knower? No, they're gone. If you take away all knowledge, all the knower, there's still something left that's observing all, that's one, that's observing all. Who is taking it away? Is it the knower or something beyond the knower? Beyond the knower. Who is that entity? That's what we find See, the That's difficulty is, you know, <clears throat> difficulty is, you know, we talk about certain things. There is a state of consciousness in everyday life in which the knower, known and knowledge, all the three of them vanish. That's called a day, the state of deep sleep. It happens to you. 
you know what happens there you have nothing you, you, you have a blank and you know, do not know whether there's an observer at all and therefore why do we need to know something which we do not we cannot actually access we being the knowers will try to acquire the knowledge of the known that's what life is all about so if you say these are taken away who takes it away it should be you or somebody else somebody else can't take away your knowledge so you take away your own knowledge this is exactly what the vedanta says you take away your knowledge by realizing that the knower the knowledge and the known are three strands into which what you call knowledge is simply split if you realize there is only one infinite consciousness there is a knower there is no known there is no knowledge and which is one vast entity and that you are don't say what happens then you know why there is no then time time comes to a stop <laughs> Yeah. Thank you. you talk about the head and the heart. It seems to me that when one is more connected with God, that <coughs> the, there's something else that's more of an energy that comes more out of the center part of the body, more of, say, the solar plexus or the stomach, other areas, than just the head and the heart. So I'm a little confused by that. Now what I was trying to say was, we usually identify knowledge or jnana with the head. What I was trying to say was, knowledge participates of the heart, not this physical heart, not the emotional heart, but the spiritual heart. The heart which is beyond the psychophysical mechanism, and the heart which is the repository of knowledge, <clears throat> not as something which is known as an object but the eternal subject knowledge the i you know where they thought i comes from when you say i come from the head or here well, let me just follow up with this if you're experiencing that would you be able to notice a change in your body would you notice a physical difference that you could observe if you saw that energy there the spiritual heart in action Suppose it does, or suppose it doesn't, what does it matter to you? It matters a lot if I'm experiencing it. Why? See, the difficulty is, you know, once again, don't reduce everything to physicality. <clears throat> why, why, is, why, why, why is it important that changes have to occur there, that should not occur there? Changes might occur, of course they could, or they may not. If, why are they important for you? you? Tell me. If you're a seeker of knowledge, spiritual knowledge, what does it really matter that the changes occur or don't changes don't occur? <clears throat> Unless you are interested that others should see changes occur and applaud you, or you feel happy that some changes have occurred. Don't worry about all this. <clears throat> when you're seeking knowledge like a scientist, go headlong after knowledge. There will be several side reactions which could happen. Let them. When you say I, you don't say I. You don't see, say I. It participates of the heart. So there is a, a, a there is a consciousness which springs up from the heart with the I thought. And you pursue who is the knower. Why is it important to pursue the knower? Is because the entire world of perception depends on me as the knower. So I want to know as a scientist, as a spiritual scientist, to inquire into the nature of this I. That could bring about many things. We are talking about the psychophysical energy. I understand that. Psychophysical energy which thinks that the, the, the prana, kundalini, so many things happen. Let them all happen. There are side reactions. So we are not interested in that. It depends on what is your focus. <clears throat> are we inquiring into the nature of spiritual knowledge? Why are you inquiring into that? We want to get out of sorrow. I at least want to go beyond sorrow. I am tired of this. <laughs> if you really seek what is that beyond sorrow, then you seek the spiritual knowledge. 
and the various reactions which take place that could they could happen you take a medicine to cure a particular disease and you don't ask the doctor will this cure it say take this definitely this disease will be cured what could be the reaction will i have a loose motion will i have some right side reaction it could but will this medicine work for the main purpose so don't worry about the side reactions which usually people get side tracked with they are called psychic powers which come with spiritual experience many of the gurus get side tracked by that it's so glamorous but a seeker of truths will never stop unless he gets into the truths no you're not satisfied We will talk about it at lunch. I didn't understand quite exactly what you were saying to say. I can take my question later. Uh, <coughs> thank you for the blissful dose of our knowledge, which oh. is normally dry. So yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I'm grateful that you hit the switch. So I'll uh, see if something you added to that. Swami Vivekananda said about the Westerners, I will give them hard, dry reason. softened in the sweetest syrup of love made spicy with work and cooked in the kitchen of yoga so that even a baby can easily digest it <laughs> look at the language yeah. but i have a uh, <coughs> uh, this uh, jagabako mukti sampa that you quoted that about that the husband loves the wife not for the wife but for the atman sense the wife loves the husband uh, And not for the husband but for the husband. So my first question is that there is this uh, love subject-object relationship here. So Atman is in the subject or in the object or in the both. That's the first question. Second question is that if the Atman is present everywhere, then why the husband or the or I love my son? Why I only love my son, not the other son? If the Atman is present in uh, all. Uh, both my son as well as another son. So why should I love uh, my son or the other son? <clears throat> the answer to the first question that when there is a relation of love, I and the other, what Yajna Valka says analyzes experience of love, which you feel towards a husband to wife, to wife to husband, etc. The reason behind this is not merely psychophysical. That is what is meant. The reason behind this love. is the expansive feeling that you have because the other is only your own consciousness projected so it unites you the love which unites through a common spiritual consciousness called the atman which is you as well as the other that's what is meant the second question <clears throat> yagya valkya is not to explain to you why you don't love everybody he says the priyatva the quality of being dear to somebody what is the source of the dearness he is asking the simple question oh you are so dear to me what does it actually mean it actually means he is your son is dear to you because the same spiritual consciousness called the atman which you and your son are these two come close to each other engendering the quality of what is known as dearness if you really felt the same atman in some other son you would feel the same emotion yagya valkya is saying anywhere when there is a quality of dearness and priyatva that priyatva is a component of sat asti bhati priya which is sachidananda he is asking where does quality of dearness and happiness and affection come in this is the priyatva of the atman itself if you felt the same way to somebody else some other son you will also have because you are not feeling that way <clears throat> he is not saying that you should feel it to everybody he is saying whenever you feel this dearness to somebody that quality of dearness is only an emanation of the priyatva component of the sachidananda satyasti bhati priya so the question is then even though atman is present in the other son <coughs> who 
which you do not know. Some of you feel drawn to somebody, and feeling drawn to somebody is because of the presence of the Atman. That's what he says. <coughs> if you felt drawn to somebody else, the thing will be there. He is only back calculating and telling you, whenever you feel some priyatva, it is actually the quality of the astibhati priyatva, not a physical or emotional attraction. This is the basis of love and priyatva. That's what he is trying to say. <coughs> And greatly spiritual people feel the same with everybody. Because the same spiritual consciousness they see everywhere. <clears throat> Some of you feel your son is related to you. And therefore you feel he is dear to you. So expand. That's why he says, Swamiji says, love is expansion. When you expand and expand and expand, you find the entire world is covered with all the dear people who are dear to you. There's nobody who is not dear to you. That's what Sarada Devi said in the last moment. There's nobody who is a stranger, my child. The whole world is your own. Cosmic counterpart of the Vijnanamaya, which is the Hiranyagarbha, there you could be satisfied. There's a kingdom of heaven. Song and dance is going on. You have so much of joy in the presence of God. But there are some people, rare souls, who are not satisfied with even that. Wherever there is name and form, there is limitation. And therefore, I want to go beyond that. But you could be happy. No problem. <laughs> Even if you reach that, it's the greatest state. <laughs> no, but my question is, how do I just practice? Is there sadhana? Let us go practice there. Sadhana? Let's, you reach there first. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> sadhana means, there you will know, if you are inquiring into that formless, there you will know how you will be pushed up. The Guru will tell you at that time, somebody will, God himself may guide you. And that happened to Sri Ramakrishna. He simply got stuck with the form of Kali. Then Totapuri said, go beyond that. Then his Guru guided him. Then Sri Ramakrishna says, imagine knowledge to be a sword by, by which I cut Kali into two pieces and went to the infinite Brahman. Don't worry, somebody will tell you at that time. <laughs> Yeah, see, I see here. Hi, Prabhu, here to stay. <clears throat> who, who else is next? And yeah. next. Yeah. Well, wanted, two, more, two more questions. Yeah. I wanted to ask you. Can you speak up a little bit? So I wanted to ask you <coughs> about, you were talking about the knower, the known, and knowledge. And then you said. The speaker to the mic. Then you said um, the Buddha. Uh, focused on uh, on knowledge itself, awareness itself, yeah. consciousness itself. <clears throat> um, could you talk a little bit more about that? See, there are three entities which we saw, Triputi, uh -huh. knowledge, knower, and known. Those who are outwardly focused and known, according to me, are the, following the path of bhakti in the spiritual life. Those focusing on the knower, the path of jnana. Now Buddha said, <clears throat> when he inquired into the knower, the I, Buddha found the I doesn't really exist, the anatta. Therefore, he, there's no question of focusing on something which doesn't exist. One. Second, he said, I have no need of an Ishvara. Why? Ishvara is a person who is regulating the entire universe, the laws of nature. Buddha said, the entire nature is a self-regulating mechanism which is given to you. Why do you invoke an Ishvara there? And therefore, he eliminated the idea of Ishvara, which is the known, and the I, which is the knower. What remained was knowledge. He said, just stay put with knowledge. Awareness. And if you stay put with awareness, you realize a dimension in awareness and you are catapulted into an awareness in which you sink into that infinite consciousness, which he did not, which he did not define. Which door is that? <laughs> <laughs> that could be the floor of uh, the fourth floor, the cosmic Hiranyagarbha. It could be. This is a speculation. What, what Buddha, actually, Buddha didn't define that. What he called Nirvana could be beyond the fourth floor or could be the fourth floor. Now, Buddha's idea was just stay put with awareness. 
in the Einstein's general theory of relativity, there's a beautiful theory about matter and space. Einstein was asked once, can you define relativity in just a few sentences? He said, Newtonian physics, earlier physics said, if all the matter in the universe vanishes, space-time will alone remain. What relativity theory has shown is that space-time will also vanish with matter. That means space, time and matter form a continuum. If matter vanishes, space also will vanish. The presence of matter distorts space and creates a curvature in space. In, if you, from that point of view, take Buddha's, this is very dramatic, very important for physics. The knower and the known could be thought of as a curvature or a curls in the infinite continuum of awareness or knowledge. What they call the known, which is God, what they call the knower, which is the Atman, both of them can be thought of as a curl or a curvature in the continuum of that awareness. They arise from it and fall into that. This is also a take of Shankara. Shankara said, Jiva, Jagat and Ishvara, they rise together or fall together. <clears throat> so those, see, these are all temperamental differences. As he was mentioning, temperamentally you feel that something is to be explained to you in a particular way. Temperamentally I feel comfortable with God. There are some people, if I have a God, I worship God and he comes back, I am happy with Then you go ahead with that, the known. Temperamentally, some people want to reflect and find out who they are, where they come from. Then you come to this jnana path. Temperamentally, there are some people who will have nothing to do with either God or the knower. <coughs> they remain with knowledge, awareness, which does, is, not, is unfocused, infinite ground of awareness. Then you stay with that. It's the temperamental differences which leads you to the various paths which you take in spiritual life. Or, if you are temperamentally so inclined, you will play with all paths, which the Ramakrishna devotees do, then you can go ahead. You go to a supermarket or a, or, or a restaurant, and then you want to taste all kinds of food. Why not? Veg, non-veg, fish, and, and then suddenly you go, no, today I'll have only non-veg. Today I'll have only veg. Pure non-veg people miss many things outside. Pure veg also miss many things. So I have a combination of all this. And sometimes you may fast also. I don't want anything to eat. <laughs> <clears throat> so enjoy spiritual life in ever so many forms, ever so many ways. That was what Ramakrishna did. Sometimes he is with form, sometimes he is without form. Sometimes he is this, sometimes he is that. It's a supermarket of religions. You go and then enjoy, go around and all that, first floor, second floor, tenth floor. You go on to Advaita, you go to the supermarket. What do you want? With the farm, go to the fourth floor. Yourself, sir, without farm, top floor. <laughs> you go around and round and you enjoy the whole thing and you come out. <laughs> Temperament. Yes, sir, somebody, uh, yeah. <clears throat> So this is the last question to take? Yes. Yeah. Uh, Swamiji, uh, the word soul is not mentioned in the entire uh, picture. So I would like to know, is it the same in Atman or yeah. they are different? Yeah. Soul, the problem is, you know, these words are so heavily loaded. Mm -hmm. Soul is a typically Christian concept that comes from the Christian tradition. So that is not exactly the same as the Atman in the Vedantic tradition. God, for example, is a word which is commonly used. In the Vedantic tradition, God is called Brahman, God is called Ishvara. There are subtle nuances there. The soul is what we call something which is, you can take it very simply, is that which is apart from the body and the mind, a spirit. You can call it the Atman. Then once again, the Atman, there are so many problems in Vedanta. When you say the Atman, do you mean Jivatman? Do you mean Paramatman? Do you mean Pratyagatman? There are so many kinds of Atman mentioned. So soul you can take as an entity which is apart from the body and the mind. It's a spirit. It's a spark which is not conditioned by the body and the mind. So we stop here. Harinamananda? We stop here? Yes, Maharaj.